Hello and welcome to the Scanlon Podcast, your weekly look at the world of film news, Irish International. I'm your host, Darren Mooney, and joining me are... Ronan. And Jay. So we're going to talk about what we normally talk about on this podcast, which includes the week in film news, the top ten, and the new releases. But we're going to start with what we normally do. So Ronan, what have you watched since last we talked? Uh, it's been a little while, but even so, I haven't managed to watch that much. Uh, I've been busy in the IFI catching up with a couple of their seasons. You, they They've, had the memory season on. They did. They've had the memory season um if I Which, remember correctly. Stop it at once. Uh, I'll come along to that in a second because I think uh, we'll be looping Jay in on this. Oh, we, fantastic. We had a little date. Uh, but just to finish up on the Trish McAdam season, which I mentioned last time I was here, um, that has been continuing and has since now concluded. Uh, I think last time I was here I was mentioning how we'd seen her most recent work and we're going to sort of travel back in time slowly. And it's been really fascinating. She's done a lot of documentary work uh, so there, it was really interesting to kind of get a sense of what she's done there. There's a lot of focus on uh, like Dublin-based uh, musicians and kind of people who would have been milling around Temple Bar through the 80s up to the present day, focusing on people as they're recording albums in uh, various studios. And she's clearly, as an artist herself, really interested in getting to the heart of sort of creative impulses and how people react in a group situation to sort of trying to get their ideas out there the frustrations that come with that uh real fascinating group of films uh kind of couple standouts um snakes and ladders her uh debut feature which i think is the only fiction feature she's made to date the one i think i've seen although oh you previously uh (laughs) it wasn't today or yesterday so i i know i've seen it but i remember practically nothing of it yeah in that um, way I, it's interesting, I went in not really knowing what to expect. This came out in kind of the early to mid-90s. Um, it's really good. It's, I remember liking it, but I don't remember why. Yeah, it struck me as a very representative film in the way, I'd say, and this comes from somebody who was not in Dublin at these times, indeed not alive in some of these times, um, but in the wrong. same way that Carl Black's Pigs is, to me, sort of in my mind's eye, representative of what 80s Dublin might have been like, this strikes me as what 90s Dublin may have been like in a certain sort of subculture. Without sector. Adam would be another uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of weird touchstone in a, mm. in a kind of this frothy right. latte uh, <laughs> 90s new Dublin kind of thing yeah and absolutely and, and there, there are some very bad films out there that try to communicate sure. the sense of 90s Dublin the likes of Goldfish Memory which I hate oh my god it's dreadful <laughs> um, and is explicitly trying to get across the notion of a queer Dublin which was emerging at the time Snakes and Ladders touches on that in a very remote way there are clearly queer characters here but it's not focused you know it's sort of almost background yeah. which is lovely it fits into the texture of the city that McAdam creates story here is two sort of uh, one is a musician, the other is a street performer um, who have a relationship um, and begin the film. Uh, he proposes to her and she sort of says, what are you talking about? People like us don't get married. And it's a real sort of anti-rom-com in a weird way. Um, an awful lot of sort of subverting your expectations yeah. and things go on. It, do, it ends, you know, it, it, it sort of moves toward this it follows a a set rom-com structure but constantly all the way is making you question the way that romance works and the way that romance films work Uh, I was really impressed by it especially coming this this was the last one to say the sort of series worked backwards through the chronology of McAdams work Um, you end up at the start of her career and it's very interesting to see the way she began in fiction that maybe led on to an influence her documentary work, which is a, a lot of stuff sort of subverting the way we normally do that as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the highlights as well was her um, her television documentary series called Hoodwinked, which is a three-part RTE series about the history of women in Ireland. Uh, it was shown in, in one block in the IFI. How long does it run? Then? It's about a three thirty-five minute episode, so oh, okay. an hour and three quarters together. It works quite well as a feature. You know, it's it's a little bit. It's very much a television documentary, and there are these sort of very repetitive interstitials that introduce sections that wouldn't be quite as repetitive in yeah, show number three space evenings, week, yeah, space that kind of thing. Three weeks, yeah. um, but it's it's absolutely fascinating. It has uh, talking head interviews with various people across the political and cultural spectra of um, of. Yeah, Lacafferty, I presume, is. 
Uh, I don't think she's actually no. interviewed in it. Yeah, she's what? she's mentioned certainly oh, because okay. she is such a towering. Presence. Yeah, I know. She the last de- couple of decades, like yeah, two decades. Yeah, yeah. Like. Uh, but it, it it kind of takes you from Countess Merkovitz and the revolutionary women God of the twenties up through uh, sort of uh, the first people to hold political office at various points, and all sorts of um, all sorts of issues like the, the campaign. Yeah, 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 she's there and she's interviewed. Campaign to um, to not introduce a ban on abortion, which obviously didn't end well. But <laughs> really, really interesting to watch this, which was made, I think, uh, the late nineties, early two thousands, perhaps. Um, in the context of today where they're talking about we've made such gains we have so much further to go and that's kind of exactly where we are we've made further gains but we still have much further to go you know they talk about all sorts of things like oh there are plans afoot to remove the constitutional reference to a woman's place in the home Jeez. here we are like 10 15 years yeah. later that's yeah. still exactly where we are right now um, really really fascinating film the whole season has been really really illuminating and lovely to have Trish herself there the whole time you know talking through these things and Unusually, I think, for a lot of um, retrospectives, she actually sat in the audience and sort of chatted with them afterwards because she hadn't seen these films herself in a very long time. Well, uh, the, which in the brought way a really interesting perspective. Really odd, kind of, the, in the way in Ireland that they're not available, probably. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. In a lot of ways. She hasn't been able yeah, to see yeah, them yeah. just like the rest of us haven't, probably. Uh, it's been really, really good. And lovely to see the IFI do that, shine a spotlight on somebody who... Um, you know, has made great work in the past and it might not necessarily be easily accessible to yeah. the public. And then the other season, as Darren mentioned, that I have been checking in on was their memory season, which uh, when they announced the program, I was really excited. It's kind of a, a big program of stuff that's more well known, but uh, it was an interesting mix for me of old favourites because everything I'd already seen here I love. And uh, you couldn't call it new discoveries, but things I've been wanting to see for yes. a very long time that it's lovely to get the chance to see on the big screen. So you had, in terms of old favourites, like Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind was lovely to catch yeah. again. Um, I thought I'd seen it more recently than I had. It's been a couple of years, actually, but uh, still great. Sort of that inventive Kaufman Gondry style. Um, went down really well, got a big crowd as well. Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind is fascinating because it, it it was basically I think one of the more famous earlier uh, kind of exponents of the kind of manic pixie dream girl thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it did somewhat critique it a little bit. Um, yeah. well, being win- a Kaufman and, film, and wins is great in it. Um, and it's it's also transparently framed through the perspective of its male protagonist yeah. as well, like in in being his memories and yeah. his projection of her. But the kind of the lo-fi kind of sci-fi aesthetic is amazing in it, like yeah. in that you don't need one hundred and fifty million to. There are all those, do, like, those lovely yeah, yeah. little bits of, you know, just using perspective to have Carrie sitting under the table and looking yeah, like yeah. a kid. Like, and it's yeah. obviously it's very hokey, sink. not actually looking like... And even the wallpaper that has the sink on the back. Uh, in the sink, that shot is fantastic. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, it really is. Like, it's really beautiful. Isn't it? And very clearly hokey, but also kind of works in a weird and way. the fact that Jim Carrey is like, you know, the kid that gets bullied and he tries to, yeah. you know, yeah, the yeah. body gets... <laughs> like, on, yeah. It grabs his arm and brings it down. It's it's like, I read like from the moment I said, ah, don't bring yeah. It's very, very funny and, you know, quite stark and sad and in the way Kaufman always is. Yeah. I just ended up walking out of the cinema wanting to watch The Neck to Cue New York again because that movie just oh, touches me on the worst kind of level. I know. Oh. Um, also, an old favourite that I was glad to catch again on, on the big screen for the first time, Spider, Cronenberg's great and sort of underrated film in that yeah. it's forgotten among his well, filmography. Yeah, one of my favourite Cronenbergs. Absolutely yeah. terrific. Yeah. And probably quite important in terms of his transition towards a more prestige I don't mean, you know, that sounds very disparaging, but a more no, of sort of grounded psychological yeah, yeah, yeah. As in that he's sort of. He's, I mean, they're always well to with Dead Ringers and stuff like that, but. Yeah, you can see this as a halfway point between The Fly mm-hmm. and, you know, stuff like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. History of Violence or yeah. The Eastern Promise. And while still being very Cronenbergian yeah. and weird and strange, you know, there's all that fantasy stuff going yeah. on. With like, is this reality? Is this fantasy? Is it dreams? Is it memory indeed? The performances um, are amazing as well. They are absolutely terrific. And the one of the great things uh, for me of this screening was that I haven't seen it since, I reckon, 2012 or so. And I'd forgotten little film. pieces of it. Yep. And so you'd see this and there's a certain twist that happens in it or whatever. I'm like, oh, I'd forgotten that happens. And it had the exact same effect as the first viewing, which was remarkable. Yeah. Ray Fiennes is absolutely yep. terrific yep. in it. And it has, I think you make a good point, Darren, about it's sort of a transition to prestige. Up to a certain point, like the opening couple of shots, 
very much work in a way that it looks like something recognizable that fits within a certain framework of you know these stories of eccentric outsiders and then Grunberg will throw in a completely left field off the wall shot where he's like ooh this is a bit this is a bit weird I'm looking at something different here he uh, he does something very strange all along the way um, as he can as he can be relied on to do yep. it's uh, it's really remarkable it's, I think it's a great film it's one of his best very disturbing and underrated oh, it's strange the is it completely the is yeah, yeah. More than it deserves to be yeah, a lot a lot more seen that's the thing not enough people have seen it at all uh, what else did we have in that season Fellini's Amacourt which I hadn't seen which is great fun and full on Fellini and you know you've bare breasted women running around corrupting teens and things very that much 70s Italian yeah, of its yeah, time yeah. great fun Really terrific and uh, very interesting on the sort of Italian family dynamic. Um, hadn't seen this one. Um, not terribly highly rated in the Fellini canon, I think, compared to. Well, is there anything I mean, not rated like, in the Fellini yeah, exactly, canon? Exactly. Exactly. I take your point. You're, you're coming it's from, not eight and a half. Is what you're, you're coming from a high floor. Yeah. Yeah. It's a four and a half star rather than a five star, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit mean. But you know what I get at in terms of Fellini is the god of canon. So, you know, well, in the way he's he held up, but then kind of thing. in Stop his collating Fellini, hey, I'm not. In se. his sort of well-known, well-regarded things, because yes. there's a lot of his early stuff that's frankly bollocks. Um, and I think, gosh, you're, you're going. You're back. being ejected from the canon as you speak, Ronan. There you go. No, we all are pickups. The well, these are the <laughs> hey, sorry, that was very good. That's very good, Darren. <laughs> we we have these early films that just aren't ever remembered. Uh, for good reason in some yes. cases oh, yeah. Amarcord of the sort of I've never seen it actually big ticket ones of his it's it's sort of lower tier of those it's very good very very interesting and some uh, really fascinating performances and the way it fits within the scope of this uh, IFI memory series it's a really interesting presentation of the way we sort of draw on the past and the way it comes back to haunt us yeah which figured big time into maybe my my second favourite screening of the series, uh, Hanukkah's Hidden, Cache. Hang on, is it a better film that you've seen? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. That's coming next, is it? Yep. All right, okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I have no idea what Ron's talking about because... I it, have it, a sneaking... I'm hoping, but I don't think it is. It's no, not, but you think not. it is, Aaron. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pivot to that <laughs> briefly because uh, that's Memento, which yes. is a dear, a dear fun film of Darren's. And I think Christopher Nolan's best film. I enjoy it very much. I don't doubt it's Chris Nolan's best film. Yeah. I think I like it more than you do. Certainly in his top four. Indeed. Do you like it more than I do? Oh yeah. I like it quite a bit. Uh, I, I'm. It's the one great Nolan film. Like great, as in great. It's one of the four great Nolan films. It's, it's what whatever Darren doesn't say. Is... I enjoyed it very much the first time I saw it. First time I thought it was great. Really, really great. Second time, and this is the first time I've seen it since probably 2010, I guess. Um, holds up very, very well. It's got some hokey moments, I think. There's a fair bit of characters explaining their own thematic relevance to each other. Yes, which is, you know, a huge part of Nolan's heavy influence yes. on modern film narrative structure. Uh, uh, yeah. And, you know, works. You should write a book on Nolan. <laughs> I, should write a, I should write a book. <laughs> Um, I mean, somebody should write a book. Yeah. Am I right? <laughs> but no, not to not to be upfront with any any. But well, uh, we'll get to that. When we get to Rocket Man later on. Indeed, uh, yeah. indeed. Any uh, people won't pay to see Reginald Dwight. They pay to see Elton John. Like, thank you for stating the theme of your film, Reg. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Here's Reg. Called Reg Dwight. <laughs> yeah. Reg Dwight, lust for power. <laughs> <laughs> No. Sorry. Um, uh, Memento, uh, I like a great deal. Uh, not a standout of this series for me, but... Um, well, I never. Unsurprisingly, it was one of the sort of uh, most successful films of the series in terms of packing the cinema. Yeah. And people loved it. I was really they do. It's really, really good. It was the... I, think, I mean, I, there are several films in the series. I love, like, uh, Wild Strawberries. They screened Wild Strawberries, which is amazing. I wasn't um, available to I was disappointed to miss that as well. And I also missed Cache as well, although I'm less keen on it than I think anybody <gasps> else in this in, group. You might need to rewatch, uh, I, perhaps. I think it's good. I but, like it. Okay, it's... so we're, we're pivoting to, to Cache. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> yes. That was a nice sort of... Uh, yeah, segment. no, that's the perfect segue. Yeah. So I watched this many, many, many times a few years back because I was doing uh, an essay in college on Hanukkah and it was kind of a centerpiece of, of what I was talking about. And I almost got sick of it. I watched it so many times. This was my first time seeing it in a good few years. And it's the combination of the sort of big screen experience. Seeing it with an audience. Really lovely print, actually. um, I'd never seen it with an audience. Like, 
pretty I much have actually back every in the old days. every Hanukkah film pre and including uh, the White Ribbon. Um, I had just watched on DVD at home alone multiple times, so I didn't really appreciate the communal experience. Watching Cashew with an audience is fascinating because it's an extremely visceral film. You know, there are a couple of key scenes that I was waiting for and couldn't yes. quite remember where in the film they take place. Yes. And you had an audience literally shrieking yeah, very there loudly. Screams. And there was actual screams. You know, even when th- there were actual screams, and even without the screams there are people like squirming in their yes. seat and that direct sort of recoiling from the screen I mean this it's film confronts you in the yeah. way yeah, yeah. that I think is extremely fascinating it, it, to an Irish audience to an any, any audience that has ever suffer, suffered under colonial occupation yeah. particularly this film is really interesting yeah, yeah. like that's before you even get to the content of the actual film this is this is like and in, in the film obviously it's explicitly French colonial guilt and nightmares about uh, Algeria um, it's explicitly stated in the film mm-hmm. and it's a kind of bourgeois kind of d- distancing from yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the stuff the stuff that's sort of a vague memory and yes troubles you a little bit and but you don't really think enough of it to very much. wake you up in a sweat at mm-hmm. night but not enough for you to do fucking anything about it yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is that's where Hanukkah is playing in that space which really fascinates me and the way this film is aged so well I think He's because this none of, all of this is still relevant now and it hasn't changed oh, yeah, 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 and that's absolutely. why the film is, I think has grown stature yeah, I would yeah. argue he's absolutely terrific at going about this way of just completely dragging the upper middle class on their complacency yeah um, their complicity in a terrible global system and particularly They're, with the Maria Le Pen's kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ascendancy in France mm-hmm. this is this is remarkably kind of what the fuck are you doing? Yep. Uh, kind of the uh, confrontation and a uh, real interest in one. And it's so much of it hangs on how Hanukkah is able to use the technique of film to make you, in a way you can't quite put your finger on, deeply uncomfortable. Yes. The way you're looking at the images. And I th- it really brought it home for me, as I say, being part of an audience. The ideas of spectatorship and perspective and bearing witness to things. Complicit. And yeah, yeah, sitting in a group of people where the idea of the film is that it's this sort of collective memory of the horrible things that France's colonial power has done and the individual things we've done to sort of hold that up. Watching with a group of people really brings that home in a very fascinating way. I think group participation is really important to a Hanukkah's work because on an individual level, and I'm watching many Hanukkahs at home, and I know exactly where you're coming from, um, in a group sense, there's a squirming that's really interesting. And there's, like the film is relatively serene mm. yeah. on the surface by like bar a couple of punctuated scenes like they're, they're like it's a quite enough film there's no real score to speak of to I don't think there's any score at all actually um, to kind of underlying dramatic moments or anything there's it continues with your straight cinematic experience in terms yeah. of what scenes you're expected to watch what scene am I watching a film am I watching a live film am I watching the actual thing that's in front of me and yeah, all the rest of those things you never quite know what you're looking at yeah it, it continuously frustrates and makes everything and about the kind of sensory kind of really uncomfortable in a way that makes me uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and the way it bloody should do and for whatever reasons you want to kind of look at um i think it's i think it's an absolute goddamn masterpiece it's fascinating i think the way that it could potentially be packaged and i believe it was at the time as a straight thriller oh it was i remember the posters yeah Uh, it's it's french french thriller if you like x you like this i remember somebody is watching you what are you going to do about it it's a bit of a mystery what's going to happen i I, I was was packaged like that Uh, it completely plays out like uh, that daniel who's in it uh, oh, did, had he had two or three thrillers after that that yeah, yeah, went yeah. got into the cinema essentially because of this mm. that like you know watch him run around in yeah, suits yeah, yeah. Uh, in thrillers and they were thrillers of diminishing returns something like that but uh, this was and his performance is outstanding uh, it really understands that that is maybe the appropriate vehicle to reach the right audience because a lot of middle yeah. class bourgeois people in France would have gone to see it expecting and that kind of film and be confronted, confronted with, confronted with exactly, something that's very very different yeah, something that they're responsible directly or I, d- I think it's Hanukkah's best film um, I, I don't think you're in full agreement with that no I don't think so there are a couple I prefer a little more I like his sort of strident earlier German work I like the art of Woody Allen I'm right afraid there. yeah the, the early funny ones <laughs> <laughs> if I can imagine Hanukkah the early funny ones right <laughs> but uh, I, I would agree there's early ones that I 
can't rate to a certain point because I yeah. don't ever want to revisit them. They're horrifying. Because they're, yeah, uh, I, The Seven Continent is extraordinary and it's a film that mm-hmm. I never, I suspect, ever watch again because, yeah, and much. I suspect older me would probably it'd be having a nervous breakdown watching it for it's many, many reasons. Way it's too much. Too much. It's too much. This is the perfect sweet spot for me in terms of yeah, that, yeah, that, no, that, no, That's kind of what I get at. Yeah, yeah. And it does leave you, I think especially the fact that it ends over an ambiguous shot that has the credits rolling over it, it just leaves people in their seats. I, to my not mind, it's not ambiguous at all, but I, when I saw it first, I think it is, but I think there's a reckoning, hmm. uh, a real reckoning coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the way that it is coming, I guess, for yeah. fans yeah. and for all of us in lots of ways. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I suspect there. that's, to my mind, that's how it was pitched, but, but it's certainly open to interpretation. Fascinating, and there has been debate that continues to this day. As with, as with oh, yeah. films, yeah, which is a great thing about it. That's what I. That's what I like. The Walk Out of a Zombie film, is that all, all of new. which <laughs> is building to. Yeah, all Amy of which Ronan. should prop up the idea that there was something better in this season. I can't even contemplate this. It was a, a first watch for me, and something that I'd been told for many, many years. Like directly, people saying, "You will like this. Trust me, you will like this." Um, Terence Davies, The Long Day Closes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a couple of months back, regular listeners may remember uh, we saw Distant Voices still live yes. in a, an earlier. Was that part of a season? Was it a once-off screening? I think it was a once-off screening. Yeah, if I showed it anyway, um, similarly on absolutely lovely print, um, and it was revelatory, absolutely magnificent. You know, Davy's way of working, having seen only his later films, starting at um, of Time in the City. Yes, um, it was great to go back and finally get a chance to see it. I absolutely adored distant voices still lives long day closes hit home much much closer mm. and had an absolutely remarkable impact on me it's one of those things which is sort of walking out of the cinema emerging into the air and sort of looking around like what do i do now where do i go <laughs> it is incredible yeah. in much the same way the long day closes you know that i or sorry the distant voice still lives is the way it captures that sense of working class family yes. identity the empathy just and the, the communication of life through song it just it's so beautifully pitched in terms of uh the idea of finding your way back to a sense of what things were in the old days good or bad yes. um the way memory haunts us and it fits perfectly in the season for that uh but the long day close is really fascinating in the way it works that in an extremely subtle way into uh, sort of discussing Davy's sexuality, which is something he's done a lot himself. I read a couple months back, um, I found it in a charity shop, his book, which was sort of based on the scripts to three short films he did before these films that I haven't seen. It's extremely explicit stuff. He does a lot more subtly in his films where he kind of discusses what it's like to grow up surrounded by a world that you know you can't really be part of but you can't quite understand why and it's an absolutely remarkable queer film in that context because it never really says you know there's a there's an early shot where he's looking at the window at a a sort of buff male gardener and you can tell there's an attraction there and that's all the film ever does to sort of codify him and then the way it plays out with these silhouetted shots of his older brother and his fiance kissing as a door closes behind them and the way it plays with cinema and the idea of romantic films and constantly seeing all these indications of a grand romantic life that deep down in a strange way you know you're not entitled to he does that so beautifully davis is a secret agent filmmaker it, like he he got budgets to do films and as you pointed out like um to basically sneak in and I wasn't not saying I mean like Dave's not he wasn't hiding he wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah but he made films for people to see a general stories like love stories or family stories or troubled stories yeah, yeah. that had an underlying uh, career narrative like mm-hmm. two of them like and, and yeah, his own autobiographical yeah. kind of take on these kind of things and that essentially what they were and but it it was a remarkably kind of subtle kind of this is mm-hmm. This is a great film that happens to have this as opposed to I am making a story or a mantra for whatever. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. Davis is like, he's a chronicler of his own life, even like, even including the time in the city in terms of his mm. upbringing in his city is 
even like the idea is kind of that kind of mocking commentary on like the football and stuff like that, yeah. you know, which I find remarkably funny and really interesting. Um, and the long day clothes and this my still lives are a remarkable one two punch of a life lived in a place where you are not really, you don't really belong, and you don't really fit. But yet you love it regardless, mm-hmm. and this it's it's almost like that abuser abuser abusive relationship yeah. of that yeah. you you know you love all of it the songs the camaraderie the family, but also you're not part of it because you're not that, but you still love it because it's emotive and it's empathetic and it's weird and it's strange and it's wonderful and it's community and I think. He didn't feel clearly didn't feel part of that community, but very much wanted it, mm-hmm. and very much chronicled it in a way that I think yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of see it, and that, that that always moved me. It's it's so expressive at getting at after the fact all of these ideas. It it does something remarkable, and that very few films manage to communicate so articulately this sense of like inarticulation yes like not being able to express you know not not even not being able to express but not being able to understand what's going on around yeah. you it's like why do i feel like i yes. don't fit in the film has that sense of expressing that from a point afterwards where you sort of you know the penny drops many years later yes. and it has all of the sadness and the longing and the regret and the sadness of that kind it's of thing. the combined joy of you know, loving this world and the people around you yes. and also not quite understanding why you're standing aside watching it from behind a window pane as he has so many beautiful shots yes. like this. Oh, it floored me. Part but separate. I think possibly the best film I've seen this year of it, any new to me films. He's oh, one of the best filmmakers God. currently working um, and in a very low key way. He just goes about his business, does his stuff, and moves on. And, and we need to continue showering him with money. I think he he does okay in terms of like he generally he does. Gets, he's, he's got the, a few in the last few years. Yeah, and I think he can do on. I mean, quality may or may not be as good as that. I mean, but who mm-hmm. who does films that good? At that stage, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. He's done two or three yeah, yeah. great, great. I know. Films. Um, like the very least. financing him. It's a right yes. off anyway. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Neon Bible is very good as well, which would have been the early That's stuff. That's the next really, one, right? Yeah, I really like that. I know uh, our Probably Phil not is level. not at all fond of his latest feature, and I, I wonder, I haven't seen it, so I can't comment. Sunset but Song, I, wasn't it? Yeah, I wonder to what extent it comes from the fact that of the stuff I've seen of his that I've adored, which is these two early features, and of Time in the City, so much of them is based on personal experience as and memory. Certainly. But I'm a big fan of um, the Emily Dickinson one as well. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah that's very good. Big fan as well. Yeah. As I and um, so with Tom Hiddleston. Oh yes, there's the one. Is it with Rachel Weisz as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or something, but I liked that a lot. What on earth is the, the name, name of that film? Um, <laughs> is does it have C in the title? Am I? Uh, am the I... Deep Blue Sea. Deep Blue Sea. Yes, yeah, yeah. I really like that too. Yeah, actually. very good. There's that extraordinary shot in the underground. That's Darren's art house credit for the week. Well done, Darren. Uh, he's one of the best filmmakers going to work though. Um, he is. He's like we should. He should. We should treasure him. In the Long day closes. Just in voices still lives. Uh, a one two punch for the ages. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know. Is it the last six months? But it's it's thereabouts that I've seen both of them. Yes, and both of them left me in that really shaken state of, you know, I think as the kids these days say, feeling seen. I would have liked to have seen uh, London Clothes in the cinema. I was away, unfortunately. Uh, I've seen it, but I haven't seen it in a long time. Uh, I will rewatch, but I would And it was a, it. a gorgeous print, too. Ah, stop. Oh, my goodness. I'm disgusted. I would have seen it. I would have been there in a heartbeat. All right. That's so, me. Jay, I can't go anywhere from that. There. Jesus. <laughs> They've gone on after the Beatles. Yeah. But not the Ron Howard Beatles documentary, alas. Um, alas. He made a he did, and, yeah. Made a Beatles documentary. He's also got another one coming out as well, which in wow. about Pavarotti. Yeah, he's got a Pavarotti Stop film wrong. coming out. Anyway, sorry. Hey. I'm really chasing that silver dollar, huh? Well, I mean, come on. If you can't trust Uncle Ron with that, have you seen Inferno? You can't. You can. You, you literally like, can't. You will get the like. You will get all the silver dollars. Have you not seen Inferno? Inferno is a oh, amazing. Inferno. Of course, we have it. Uh, Inferno, which is the third Dan Brown film, but it's basic. oh. Oh, but it's it's amazing because it's quite no, it's literally not. it's grandpa's no, it's day not. out. It's all the things that terrify your grandpa put in a blockbuster starring Tom Hanks who your grandpa loves. It's like he's running through a park and there are drones overhead and they're like buzzing over his head and he's panicking. Oh no, he's at like a, an exhibit at a museum. 
and somebody's <laughs> stolen it. And he, but it's okay because he's going to find it, put it back and put the ribbon down. <laughs> so everything is perfectly where it should be. The put film, the ribbon down? Yeah, the little, you know, the little velvet rope. He puts the little velvet rope back. Oh! Like the, film, the film ends with him replacing like something that was stolen from a museum and smirking as the guards try and figure out what's happened. I thought these <laughs> things were about Jesus having kids. No, that's the first one <laughs> and the second one. Third one is about... That's like, COVID <laughs> a pod, yeah. podcast there. Are you talking about Jesus having kids? <laughs> but yeah, and the, like the climax of the film involves a lot of splashing in a pool that is Scared about steady. somebody's waist. Most climaxes do. Uh, hi oh. oh, but again, Ronan. For you, thank you for that, oh, yeah. Ronan. Um, but yeah, I don't think we're gonna top that. Oh wait, <laughs> so to speak. anyway, stop, stop. Oh, jeez, wow. easy guys. That, that was unintentional. Again, how do you follow <laughs> this? Um, anyway, sorry. So you were saying about Ron Howard's <laughs> Beatle documentary. <laughs> Oh, lads. You watched that this week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Need a breather. Hang on, give me a second. All right. <laughs> uh, so, right yeah, okay. so Inferno has lots, like the climax is basically I... being at a pool that's only waist deep and kids are splashing around you. It's the most it's the most silver age dollar action blockbuster I have ever I seen. Kind of I kind of watch it. But, I uh... feel like if I was like a 60 year old person, that movie would speak to me. I wouldn't be seen because I'd be too old to use that euphemism, but it would speak to me. Anyway, sorry, Jim. Right, where do I begin? Um, okay. I'll start with a 1967 film that uh, is kind of terrible, but kind of good, uh, which is Valley of the Dolls. Um, uh-huh. From the Jacqueline Susan novel, which I've read recently for a thing. The novel's fantastic, by the way. Film less so, uh, but it does have um, Sharon Tate playing one of the women. Oh. It's a story about three women in New York City who kind of... Uh, it, the novel is from the mid-40s for, mid to the late 60s, mid-60s. The film has it just essentially set in the 60s, who become kind of stars slash uh, famous in their own way and then become addicted to the dolls, which are the various pills that kind of may help you sleep help you wake up help you wherever that kind of 60s drug kind of thing and the book is fabulous really funny and really yeah. smart the movie is less so but it is fun there is a lot of fun to be had in it uh, it probably arrives a few years too early the book was quite scandalous in the mid 60s the film was in 67 it probably needed a post easy writer kind of uh yeah. Released to do with justice in a lot of ways, and presumably even like sixty seven arriving before like the crash out of sixty eight and the hangover of sixty. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, so it would have been it, kind exactly. of post post uh, Bonnie and Clyde post thing would have been where it would have been pitched yeah. Easy Rider into the early into the east and into the seventies. Yeah. Post Altamont so kind maybe, of territory would yeah, have been perfect, it. but uh, it's probably a little too a couple of years too early in terms of it's. We haven't. Had it still has it's it's yet. caught somewhere between the kind of new Hollywood and the coy kind of Hollywood code kind of thing and it doesn't quite yeah. manage both it, it doesn't manage either in some ways like um, cast great uh, there's some good novel moments from the novel that are captured really well but it's it's very uneven um, but kind of watchable though and the songs because it's one that is just kind of set around the kind of uh, the Broadway kind of shows kind of thing when the characters have a kind of career in that and so some of the songs are quite good in it Um it's one of those things that I didn't mind watching completely for any real moment. Like, I really enjoyed it, but it's, it, well, it's also knowing that it's not great. And it's probably because I love the novel so much that I was kind of happy to watch an adaptation. Yeah. That, and it was just a, there's probably a world to be made of doing something again with it, but it has to be updated because I don't think it quite worked. Uh, but it, it was a curio. It was one of those interesting ones that I, I really liked. Um, now on to one of the... How do I put this? One of the best films I've seen this year. Um, Hello. I watched High Life. Um, mm. One of your most anticipated as well, actually. Well, and yes sadly and no. didn't make the top ten. Uh, Somehow didn't make the top ten. Claire Denise, Somehow. as a filmmaker, I've been very... It's box, it's box office wasn't stratospheric. Sorry. Jesus. Uh, as a filmmaker that I'm not quite kind of connected with over the years, I've seen... This is my, f- I think, fourth film of hers I've seen. I've seen Bastards. I've seen um, White Material. And I have seen Boat Royal. Uh, which is probably a rest uh, up until this point. That's one that's very, very highly regarded. I generally. thought High Life was better. Um, remarkably. Um, this is a strange film. I, I watched it. You've seen it, right? Yeah, I watched yeah. it. Yeah. it is, the kind of first half hour is this kind of abstract 
kind of story about a guy knocking around with a kid in a spaceship um, without really any kind of context, which is fine because like, you feel that there's kind of this information will be drip fed. It creates a very interesting yeah, sense does, of mystery. And, and visually it's very interesting uh, in that, in a sim- weirdly kind of similar way to, not a similar way actually to Eternal Sunshine, but in that kind of lo-fi sci-fi. It doesn't really give a fuck about space yeah. or about kind of uh, interstellar variations of cinematic kind of space thing. It doesn't, it doesn't really space care. Space is a big black void. It yeah, doesn't yeah. really care about Which that. is absolutely true. Um, so it kind of, but then it kind of settles down into this kind of backstory of this group of people who have committed crimes essentially and being told that okay you've got a one way mission to do X so we can get data from a black hole essentially and and in amongst that there should, there will be a doctor there who will basically hope to be able to procreate on this spaceship in in time and that's essentially the plot um, except that it does really, to my mind, really remarkable things with that. Um, there's this, obviously, kind of, with space films, you'll generally get a kind of end of the world vibe in the sense of oblivion, particularly around black holes and the kind of end of everything, the end of sense, the end of actual time and all the rest of these things that can bring. And I think these does really interesting things to this. There's a kind of early sequence where somebody kind of is kind of catapulted towards it has this really visceral oh. kind of moment which really not shocked me but it certainly it, it's it's really harsh in the way that I expect it would be if you were hurtling towards anything um but I, I found it really interesting that there's this absolute fascination with the hilariously awful meat sacks that we are like yeah. uh and what we contain both inside ourselves and inside ourselves and then outside ourselves <laughs> depending on how you want to put it uh, and there's obviously there's the kind of thing that come up with the fuck box which is essentially that's uh, one of the kind of I guess the most remarkable scene with Julie Pinoche yeah it's it's but to my mind whilst it is fascinating and really interesting it's not the most interesting part of the film it's yeah. it's a it's a it's addressed matter of factly even regardless of that scene which is remarkable in its kind of hunger and need uh, which this film really lives on or lives off, if you will. Like uh, there's, there's this kind of desperation to live in a like these aren't people. Like they're they're almost essentially animals. Like yeah. at the start of it, and then but there's 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 she, the director uh, Denise allow, allows this kind of personal growth to kind of creep in off that you can find humanity where it doesn't really matter because it won't be any use to you in the grand scheme of things, but it's still there. You still have a, we still have a potential to grow from nothing that you can yep. still learn. You can still learn to do something. And that's probably our most damning thing that we can all still learn even while we're hurtling towards the abyss because that's what we all literally are doing like as, as we go. Like, um, Patterson, who's the main guy in it, who's been doing remarkable work for a long, long time regardless of what you think of him in life or how he looks on Twilight or the rest of it, mm-hmm. which I've heard various things. That's fine. But he has been doing remarkable work for quite a long time with really interesting directors, and he's really, really good here. As the rest of the cast, and he's our next Batman. Yes, and his next Batman. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. That the cast around him, for the most part, other than um, uh, what's her face, the uh, uh, is unknown to me. But they're all very interesting and really good. I thought it was astounding. Uh, I it really floored me and. That's a rare thing, and particularly as a director, I didn't quite kind of, I still haven't quite gotten in sync with. And then it's one of those things that you watch it and go, maybe I will rewatch certain things to see yeah. if it kind of sinks me a little more. Uh, I, I absolutely loved it. It's in my kind of top two or three of the year. Nice. Uh, it was really, really fascinating to me. Likewise, I'm kind of the same with Denis in the past. I haven't necessarily hooked with other stuff. I didn't like Bastards very much. And I neither remember did I. at the time, fans of hers, and I have to say, I haven't seen some of the big hitters of her career. But fans first were saying, oh yeah, this is classic. This is the kind of stuff she does really well. And watching it and just thinking, oh, eh, yeah, it's the same. maybe not for me. But I adore Trouble Every Day. Which and, I haven't seen. Um, it's interesting to me that both sort of use the framework of genre that's uh, on, on a very, very high level uh, vampire yeah. film. Yeah. This same way, this on a very, very high level as a sci fi film, because it's exactly as you say, it's the idea that we're all hurtling towards our death. 
and we have to figure out something to give that meaning. But, you know, it, it sort of essentializes the idea of what we're all going through. It's The high concept is really just something to give a bit of a framework to yes. what she's doing. The spaceship's fundamental. People are fundamental. They're not, yeah. it, none yeah, of it's yeah. anything in yeah. a yeah. kind of look at this. Well, was this? You're well, not going to get any sort of strange, interesting, spacey plot developments here. No. She's really going deep on a, a sort of human existential level. But without ever being in any way boring, because my God, there's some stuff here that I have just never seen yeah. at this budget level. Yeah, I don't know how she did it. Like some of this stuff is, and it's again, I think remarkable. credit to uh, Panson here that he's he's going off and really throwing his budgetary weight behind directors who want to do something yes. interesting. Uh, it's really great to see something and like I this get this, funding. If he does do Batman, it'll probably fund a fuck knows how many directors' worth of work in the next yeah, decade yeah, yeah. as well in terms of production credits and whatever. Like. It's just terrific. Maybe he's realizing that that he needs to do another big blockbuster. To but get it's more okay though. I won't find out. I, 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 no, I think if he, it gives he, us he more stuff like actor, this, because like. this is really remarkable. I think a lot of people have pointed out that it has some kind of clear sci-fi breast and stuff like Tarkovsky Solaris. Yes, which it does. But what it really reminded me of from the get-go is um, Silent Running, the Doug Trumbull film. Uh, it's got this that's whole, the one with the, the environmental yeah, the yeah, robots, yeah, yeah yeah Bruce Dern yeah, being that's exactly just it. Just the garden of Eden the garden of Eden the garden, they've things, got yeah. the garden that they keep returning to and it doesn't really play a big point in the plot but people keep sort of going there and sitting and, and finding include, their humanity and chatting one with scene where there's a kind of a kind of montage Eden piece where somebody's lying there and then they're not which I Found remarkably yeah, moving yeah, in about in about seven or eight seconds. Uh, kind of extraordinary. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of little things like that that really I kind of want to go back and kind of look at you. And then in in going to the very furthest reaches of the universe, she's trying to find something about humanity, and I think she does. It's, I I, 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 I don't think I liked it quite as much as yeah. you, but oh my god, I was fascinated by it. I I absolutely adored it. Um, but yeah, I in the context of we talked about box looks either last week or the week before. We did, uh, uh, which I'm a huge fan of, and you're okay in it, you know. I'm fine. I got no big yeah. issue with yeah. it. Um, Luke loathed it with the past. Yes, past and burning I knew somebody did, and I was wondering. Um, no, it wasn't. Screw me. you, Luke. No, I'm joking. Obviously, I was. I was very uh, agnostic on it. Yeah, that. like I was. I, one of those things where it's aware of how obnoxious it's being. Does that excuse it being obnoxious? And I'm like, I'll give you a pass. Yeah, it does, but I take your point. Um, I watched Child of a Leader, uh, which is uh, Brady which Corbett's first song. Which brings these two themes together, indeed, uh, indeed. Pattinson uh, and Corbett. Yes, I had a lot of Pattinson uh, kind of kind of thing this weekend. Um, this is not good. Um, <laughs> it's it's incredibly technically impressive. I like if you've seen Box Look, it's you can't really argue with its technical skill. Oh, I, no, I no, like it, like it. regardless of anything. If you don't like it, I, like it's really the director knows exactly what he's trying to do. Yeah, and I mean, again, this is the thing where he's very much a student of a particular style of yes. filmmaking. Yes, oh, very much. A very good student of it, but perhaps yes. too good in, yes. in terms of and narrative. And I think Fox looks better because okay. he's sh- shaken off a little bit of that. Yeah. Here, it's very much uh, clear where. I haven't seen Child of a Leader, but I imagine it has a bit less of the art sense of humor, which probably takes some of the it's edge off. It's laughably overwrought. Yeah. Like, I mean, drama <laughs> yeah. in 20-foot high words. Yeah. Given uh, its wow. themes, content, and yes. Yes, substance. It's like, if you do not know what we're talking about, let me tell you quickly, loudly, over two hours, how much, That's how much, quick. how much, how much we drama we have. And... Oof, but really, Don't you dare badmouth Christopher Nolan's theme as it, dialogue. It undermines so much good stuff because there's really interesting stuff in here that, like, you're watching, it's like, please don't do that. I'll be done that. Uh, I, love I was it. rooting for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mini Hitler. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff. Um, and it's like, don't do that. Mid-Murray. Oh, you've done that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Starring. Jesus. Uh, the Scott Walker score who also scored also uh, Box Luck uh, yeah. is really good in this one unfortunately the score is great the movie's overall the score mm-hmm. is overall so put them two together and it was mighty. Uh it, it was exhausting um, in the way and I, I, I'm actually appalled I'm going to use this in the way Darren would use it it's fascinating um, I don't get why you don't like the use of that word in that context. It is fascinating. Because it says so much without saying anything. Uh, that's why it's brilliant. I know, right? All right, uh, but it's not very good. Um, interesting. A few people have come on Twitter and say that they they're huge fans because it, it's a kind of everything but the kitchen sink approach. That's fine, particularly a debut. There's yeah. an assuredness to it, whatever. And Jay, I'd be disappointed if you were just following the leader. It's pants. It's just it's like. 
it's like if only Hitler had a kiss in the boo boo, everything would be great. It sounds uh, like it's a very, very good thing you saw Vox Lux first. Yes, because I'm not sure I would have watched it. I probably wouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually fair. Uh, and the so, question whether or not this will colour any subsequent rewatch of it. No, I don't think it will. Oh, I, right. I think there's enough promise in that film as boneheaded as occasionally is. I think there's, there's <laughs> some really interesting stuff in it. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's real promise. And to some degree, it's realised in Vox Lux. It might take half a star off Vox Lux a little bit. But I still really like it. Right. Uh, but finally, before we uh, get bogged down in mini Hitlers, uh, I went. Thanks, lo- Jay. Sorry. Um, I went. To, I went along to the uh, light off screen of the Brace of Suicides. Yeah. Ah. Um, on Monday night. Um, twentieth anniversary screening. Yes. It's one of those great one of those movies from the year that was nineteen ninety nine. That was twenty years. Yes. Ago. When, so old. Oh shut up, you're not old. I went to see this in the cinema when it came out. God damn you all. <laughs> I remember watching this. You were like rented, three months old I or rented the fuck this you were. on DVD. My parents rented this on DVD. It was great. Cause, and then it's it's interesting watching all these retrospectives because I have now these memories of watching these movies, like uh-huh. on the home video from Extra Vision. I was twenty four, Darren. It was like my introduction, Darren, like 12 years old at the time, his introduction to the cinema with mom and dad coming home from the video store or Darren going to the video store and being like, let's watch Fight Club this week. I can reach up the high shelf. Yeah. God damn you all. I hear there are boobies in that one. Um, But yeah, so that sort of stuff. But it's... But anyway. But no. You I decided that really sweet moment. You sons you. bitches, all of you. Uh, That's us. So, yeah, I haven't actually revisited a very suicide since I saw it in the cinema all those years ago, um, and which I liked when I saw it. Uh, but I don't have any particular kind of special, it was great kind of thing, but I remember yeah. liking okay. it, but beyond nothing beyond that. Um, I've gotten kind of chunks of it, and I've read the novel. Uh, it was somewhat overshadowed bit. by Lost in Translation, I think. Uh, yeah. Lost, in, Lost in Translation arrived and was this big thing. I know it hasn't aged particularly well, but when it arrived, it was heralded uh, as the future of independence. The Virgin it. Suicides is... Mm, like in a different country in terms well, of quite, quality. Quite uh, yes. The Bird Suicide is remarkable. Um it's absolutely stunning film. Um this there's something really interesting about how Coppola approaches this. Um the story of five young girls in a family who and the title will probably is a, a spoiler as you say. Um who have a kind of fateful summer, I guess, for want of a better word. And they kind of, it becomes a story of the unknown kind of space between that kind of young age where you understand a certain amount of the world, but not nearly enough to know a little more to help you out. You know, where you you can grasp enough themes, but not quite enough to... Mm -hmm kind of pull you out of this month I guess for want of a better phrase and the story of these young girls who kind of uh, are stuck in a kind of family that's kind of religious Kathleen Turner and James Woods are the parents boo to James Woods uh, <laughs> who's sickeningly very good here uh, I mean like yeah. Woods problems were never that he no. was a bad actor no but he's a cunt I, Yes. Yeah, like yeah. just to say, that it should be, and it's just to be, that it can't be, yeah. it can't be, uh, it can't be stressed like, enough I mean, that he's an absolute yeah. I cannot. Freak. I, yeah, yeah. But I he person. is very good in this, yeah. and Kathleen Turner is very good in this, and they're kind of these religious parents who kind of keep a strict hold on the five girls, and then it's their kind of awakening, both sexual and kind of uh, awareness of the world in general, and the kind of boys around that. And it's one of the boys are is kind of, I guess, as an older person narrating the story. And of what happened that fateful time. And it, it essentially is a coming of age story in a most macabre sort of way. Um, but it's, Coppola is really interesting here. She, there's some remarkable close-ups of uh, the girls' faces. They're kind of, they're not, they're almost not individuals half the time. They're kind of grouped. Mm, part of a collective. Uh, collective, yeah. In the way Mustang, which would have been, I'd mentioned before, is very um, kind of, yeah, I think it's very influenced by it. Uh, and there were the, the shots of girls, all four or five of them lying on top of each other, legs of God, who belongs to who. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Grace made the point that, you know, how they're framed in doorways and kind of uh, spaces is really, really fascinating in terms of how they exist in their world. And it's just kind of. Uh, weirdly intoxicating story that's and it is intoxicating I think it's the perfect word for it it's kind of half remembered 
fever dream slash nightmare that they exist in. And the score and music is astounding. The filming of it. There's this kind of, you know, whatever you call it, business saying or production design, which I think is really important to film, where every shot in the house has some item of clothing or presence of, like, a, a discarded slipper or something. Mm-hmm. This is a messy house full of people that live in it and not in the way that films do. Every house generally in American cinema is pristine. And, yeah. you know, and now and again, you'll see it, you know, clean up your room and then the clean room. You'll never see it again because it doesn't exist in the card. There's stuff swapped here. There's clothes swapped here. There's stuff leaning on banisters in the room. Everything is about the drips of life, but this life that's being held down in a very real, real way and it kind of can't escape that kind of um, kind of hold. It's absolutely remarkable. Like I, I would. It's one of those films that I couldn't believe was as good as it was. Mm. My memory wasn't obviously strong enough that I would have happily sat down and just press play again and watched it again. It's astonishing. Uh, like I watched two Coppola films after kind of haughtily dismissing Coppola <laughs> less than eight months ago uh, after watching Somewhere as. Which is horrible. Somewhere is terrible. Uh, Unambiguous. But I've watched uh, Bling Ring and this, and my God, if that's all you ever do as a director, yep. you're 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 good. Like I mean, there's directors that there have been lionized that will <laughs> never come close to something that good. Uh, yeah, re- absolutely remarkable. Loved it. Please revisit ASAP. Yeah, it's absolute years since I've seen it, and I remember next to nothing I about it. I suspect you will adore it. Yeah. I remember it being very very good. It is. It really, really is. But anyway, that's me. All right. Uh, very, very briefly then. Um, so yes, I rewatch Glitter because I have lots of important things to do and very important schedule to keep. And apparently, I have time to watch Mariah Carey's 2001 flop twice in the space of two weeks. Yeah, you do. Uh, yeah, it's amazing how bad this is in boring ways. Um, like it should be a car crash, but instead, it's just a mildly dizzying, migraine-inducing. Poorly edited, uh, sort of, yeah, piece Is of work. Is it fascinating? No, not necessarily, not really. <laughs> it's it's grand. Grand. Uh, no, it's don't more, ruin it. No, there. it's not grand. It's also it's <laughs> n- it's far what? from grand. Um, it's more interesting for what's happening, sort of behind the scenes and stuff, mm. and also like. Terence Howard, who like James Woods, is probably a te- is a terrible human being based on what we know of What's him. What's Terence Howard do? I've no a idea. Domestic abuse. Um, ah, for fuck's and, sake! Why uh, is everybody terrible? But yeah, um, and also his his interview persona is less than flattering. He spent uh, mm. he's done a lot of press talking about glitter and how glitter was fine because the uh, female cast members all wanted to sleep with him because he could smell when they were ovulating, uh, which Jesus feels like Christ. His, which feels like his pitch for a, a Marvel Cinematic Universe how? movie. Um, <sighs> how did yeah. I know that? Yeah, he just Google Google Terrence I, Howard. I, I, or don't. No, no, I'm not going. I, I, yeah, but, but okay. it, Jesus, which is really disconcerting because he is by far the best thing in this film. Yeah, it's disgusting, isn't it? It's yeah, when that happens, because yeah. he exudes this sort of menace, which in presence, which none of the other cast have, and it's weird to like cling to him yeah. when he shows up because it's like finally this movie has a pulse. It's very strange. It's very disconcerting. Doesn't save the movie, uh, if only because he's not in it nearly enough. But even if he was, it would still be very uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, in terms of other movies I watch, I also watch Holmes and Watson. Because, again, I'm a very busy man who only has time for the best things in life. You really do, don't you? Holmes, like, and, I mean... Holmes and Watson is in that awkward place where it's both neither as bad as the internet and everybody says that it is while still being terrible. It's kind of hmm. amazing that there's a gulf between those two extremes that there exist. There really is, actually. There shouldn't um, be. There should, there should be no <laughs> like, space there. There like. should be, like, it's terrible, and that that's the end. And of we're it. all happy with and, that. Like. Yeah, and, but no, no, this is like a plague on mankind. And it, it's not really. It's just dull. It's not funny. It's dull it's worse, tired, though, in some yeah. ways, isn't it? And there's a real sense of fatigue going on here as well, and a sense yeah. that, like... And I wonder, like, again, I think The Verge made a point when it came out that, like, maybe this is the end of a certain style of comedy. These I sort think of it might be. J- Judd Apatow sort of improvisational, feral, sort of, like, feral-based kind of yeah. uh, sort of comedy. And whether this is, like, the death of that to a certain extent being replaced by something more high concept, like, say, Tag or, like, say, Game Night it or whatever. It certainly had its run. Yes, that's it exactly. Yeah. And you yeah. can, maybe you can trace the sort of, you can graph it almost and see, like, the house, you know, from two years ago. And it's as probably, being a it's probably inevitable sort of, as well, yeah. right? Because, yeah, I mean, everything runs at a certain point. Yeah. And it's been a good run 
alone. Like they've been over a decade. Well, I mean, kind of they've been doing it since probably years, around, like... yeah, 17, 18 years at this point. Two thousand one yeah. was Zoolander, to pick an example. Um, but which I mean, is aged better than most of them. I no, it has Terence Malick's favorite film of all time. Well, Malick would know stuff. He's great. T- he's great um, taste. Yeah, Holmes and Watson is like it suffers from a number of obvious problems. It makes the same jokes repeatedly without in- developing them or expanding them. So, for example, it's constantly making oh look at this modern reference in this historical setting. Isn't that hilarious? Or who look at how casual people in Victorian times were about drug use. Isn't that hilarious? And it's like, no, no, it wasn't funny the first time. What, why do you keep coming back yeah, to what it? Do you, what else you got? Yeah, um, it wastes its cast. Um, and it's just got, yeah, it's just very, very awkward. And it doesn't really work at all. Um, but yeah. I'm a big Talladega Nights fan. And so it this pains me. This would be disheartening. Me. Yeah. Yes, don't do this. No, no, I'm not going to. I'll just rewatch Talladega Nights. That's it. John C. Riley's actually quite good in this. As John C. Riley's good in everything. In everything yeah, yeah. But he not he really, really needs a better... Level well, no, of film. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, he's had Stan and Ollie this year, and I mean, the Sisters Brothers. In fairness, no, you're right. No, you're absolutely right. No, I, I'll retract that statement. Yeah, I mean, right. you have two. Like the irony is, you have two best actor level performances from Riley this year, and what he ended up winning was the Golden Raspberry. Uh, um, in terms of other stuff, that's I watched. Brutal. Yep. Sorry. The The Lonely Island presents the unauthorized uh, Bash Brothers experience. I've heard this is a Netflixy thing. Is or it's on something Netflix. that I am just amazed exists I'm probably going to watch it this it is a half hour concept album about Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco's 1988 baseball season it's done in the style of Beyonce Terrence Malick and the Beastie Boys I've read reviews this apparently what? it's kind of high concept weirdness it's and you don't, don't even if you, realism, if you, you, you don't, don't like sport it doesn't matter you, I, you, I don't know anything about yeah. baseball apart from some research I did for writing a Star Trek article three years yeah. ago and I was able to follow this perfectly like this is a it has Maya Rudolph singing shake 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 that ass I'm, at on Andy I'm all Sandberg. over it um, it has you know it has one of the best performances of the year from Sterling K. Brown playing Sia what yeah it's like the I don't fact, know. I've heard insane things. The about fact it. that I this exists <laughs> is like amazing. People say there's too much content out there. Right? There is. People say there's too much material. There People is. say they'll green light anything. They'll give money they to anything. <laughs> and you know what? I look at this and I say, if that's what it takes to make this something that I can just stumble across on Netflix, I am okay with that. No, I'm not. But I take your point. <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna so watch it. Though. I will watch it. I've heard. I, I would wholeheartedly things. recommend it. It's. I can't explain how it exists. I don't know what purpose it serves, but I love that it does. Uh, um, I like you, 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 you have me sold, and I, I'd already read a bit about it. So. Uh, and in terms of other weird stuff that I watched this week, I, re- I watched the Macra Terror, which is the 1967 Doctor Who serial, which was famously lost. Uh, the BBC cleared out their records because who was going to own home media in 1967? A tape over um, they, Like yeah, RT did. Yeah, that's exactly. They would record over the videos, but they'd also destroy the film and junk yeah, the film because they needed space to storage idiots. and stuff like that. And a whole host of stuff was awesome. On some Monty Python, I think. Yeah. All Spike Lee's, not Spike Lee, Spike Milligan's. Yeah, Spike, uh, work Lee with the, would, yeah, Spike would not let born. that happen. Yeah. Uh, but Spike Milligan's uh, work was also lost at the BBC as well. The difference with Doctor Who, and we kind of discussed about this, is because it has the fan base that it does, it A, has the interest to reconstruct these things, and B, actually has the materials. Because fans would have recorded audio off the television sets, even in 1967. So they have, like, audio recordings of all these things that, that were lost. That is quite remarkable that people did that. And so what they've begun doing in order to, and again, this is protecting the brand or expanding the brand or hoping to create something merchandisable later on, is they've started going back and filling in the gaps of the lost episodes with animation, reconstructing it from mm. the actual audio recording of the original broadcast, uh, and still stills that were taken and production materials that exist in order to create like an animated version of that. And it's fascinating to behold. Um, it's very, very strange as well, because obviously the animation is done in a style with reference to like more modern styles of filmmaking. You can see in camera movement, stuff like that. There's an action sequence in here that would have been completely unimaginable on a 1967 Doctor Who budget, to yeah. make an example. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting to watch because it has that weird sense of like symmetry that we have in modern culture between the late 60s and now. I mean, it's a, it's a cliche Can I ask to describe. Like, yeah. Is it? Are, are, do, do, we, do we know the visuals beyond I know it was destroyed you have screenshots and pictures and but stuff like that. do we know the flow visually of this story or is it just have they taken the animation has taken a run with it as opposed to is it a shot by shot it's not a like, shot no, it's, cer- it's certainly not a shot I was just curious shot. as to what um, was known and whatever it's based upon again and there's a sense in which it's 
done with interviews from the surviving cast and crew and there aren't many it's 1967 and it's the BBC you would have been quite old if you were directing yes. them back then <laughs> uh, but also even things like fans memories although those cheat uh, and those are sort so of there's a lot of kind of weird kind of hybrid between yeah, the, the collective old, memory and the yeah, play around that kind that's of, it exactly that's fascinating I like, kind of like the interest in it, thinking it's that it's almost like a reconstruct and yeah. you, obviously you have the audio recording like the audio recording gives you a marker Okay. Um, so you ha- you know what it sounds like and you yeah. know what lines so are you delivered where. So you can play it from and, there. Like. And that's it exactly. So you have to make it, you, you're syncing up to that in effect, which is an interesting sort of experiment. Would have fit in the memory on film season actually, yeah. weirdly. In a... uh, well, well, I mean, they do, they screen these things at the BFI uh, tradition yeah. as well, which is BFI is, is very good for that kind of um, uh, which TV is, stuff. Yeah. Um, and it, it's fascinating. Again, it's a product of the late 60s and it's in the context of the, the where the show was at the time, it's very much trying to figure out whether it's part it's this 1960s happened around the same time you were talking about with uh, Valley of the Dolls yes. but this is the point where Doctor Who again which has always been very engaged culturally as a television show week on week just in terms of basic production yeah. trying to figure out where it stands in relation to the counterculture and there are moments in the Trout Near like uh, the Dominators where it's very much pro-establishment where it's like damn those hippies just <laughs> wipe them out because they can't be trusted to take care of themselves yes, yes. the Macra Terror is absolutely fascinating because like some of the best installments of the time it is very, very, very pro hippie. It is a story. Um, it's the standard template of the time, and it's kind of fascinating because it, it hadn't been established. The base under siege, and the idea is that in the base under siege, you have a location. It's usually like a spaceship, a moon base, you know, an ice research station or whatever, yeah, yeah. and it's being menaced by some sort of mysterious outside force. And this is always particularly uncomfortable in the late 60s because you've got Enoch Powell's River of Blood taking place at the yes. same time. And so you're contextualizing this idea of a homogenous group being assaulted by forces outside. What makes the Macra Terror absolutely fascinating and why it's great to see it animated and why it's such a strange, strange serial is that like it initially seems like there are strange crab-like monsters that are coming into the base at night and feeding randomly on people. It's eventually discovered that the crab-like creatures are living at the centre of the base, directing the people in the base to work mining this toxic gas that they need to survive, um, and basically exploiting their labour force, keeping them so drunk. It's coming on... from inside the house. Like... Yeah, the call is coming from inside. The oh, yeah. siege is coming from inside the base, yeah. so to speak. And you have this kind of, again, this sort of very like we talked like in the eighties. The show famously wanted to take down Thatcher. Um, this was the mission yes. statement from the the executive producer. Didn't we all? Yeah. Um, yeah. In the early 2000s, Russell T. Davies killed Tony Blair, stuffed him in a cupboard, and then vaporized George W. Yes. Bush. What? Um, Stephen Moffat advocated for people. dismantling. Um, well, I mean, it's heavily implied that it's Blair. It's not stated, but he's the prime minister. Well, also, Tony like... Blair is a robot, so yeah. nobody would deny that. Um, and I mean, you you have Moffat as well advocating for both punching racists and dismantling capitalism. Yes. Um, that sort of stuff. So you have like this sort of stream of sort of like radicalism. Which always through. makes me funny that we're kind of. It, all of this kind of stuff is okay but once you bring a woman multiculturalism into it, yeah. into it like, a it's woman like and people hang on what are you politicising Doctor Who for yeah. then <laughs> a great that's impersonation a I really terrible, really like that that's your your average English my, troll my, isn't it in it my personal yeah, favourite one is the fact that you have that in an episode after Jodie Whittaker has just saved Amazon and yeah. you're like why are you bringing all this lefty politics into it and you're like she literally just saved Amazon you don't get to call that liberal lefty politics but if a woman does it <laughs> yeah that's it exactly um, we're a weak arms <laughs> or whatever yeah but again, they come you, you have like but the, fucking idiots the anyway sorry the macro terror is basically a call to class warfare where the doctor ends up rallying I'm with, I'm with work, this rallying the workers in this abandoned colony being sort of drunk on wine and circuses this is right up, this is right <laughs> up my street I'm to rise up wine. and destroy the predatory literal parasites that have taken root at the heart of their sort of society and are basically killing them in order to feed and gorge themselves alright uh, it's, so it's like big business it's pretty much let's, let's of, kill them all it's kind of a amazing in the context of this being a kind of a family show in 1967 yeah, on the I'm, I'm kind of with it I have to um, say I'm, I'm, I'm all with it this, I'm, my sympathies lie with the workers yeah, yeah, right there um, and then finally I watched uh, I rewatched The Incredibles uh, which still holds up it's interesting to go back and watch an old Pixar film because like you remember again this is the memory thing that you described the idea yes. of like remembering something differently from how it is um, but it's like you go and you watch The Incredibles and every time you watch a Pixar movie it's like this is incredible I've never seen animation like this this is pushing the form forward Forward. And then you go back and you watch older ones. And the animation's never bad, to be absolutely clear. But watching The Incredibles, it's very clear that this is relatively early Pixar. This is 2004. Yeah. And so the, the texture on the skin isn't quite as complicated as it is in, say, The Incredibles 2. Yes. The models aren't as detailed. And it's kind of fascinating because you're like, I remember at the time being blown away by this. And this is... This is like, you know... I, I expect this on a half-hour kids' cartoon show yeah. today. Um, 
But The Incredibles still holds up. It's absolutely amazing. It's um, Brad Bird directing. Um, it's this sort of, it's one of the best superhero movies ever made. It's very much a 60s pastiche. It's part Fantastic Four, part Watchmen, as crazy as that sounds. But it's also Alfred Hitchcock directing a James Bond movie that happens to feature superheroes. And I kind it's also, of... it's one of the most miserable opening acts of any film, if I remember correctly. Yes. It's sad and weird and, and grey and depressing. Not, not only that, but like the themes it gets at. Even when yeah, I was yeah. a teenager watching this, it's like, Bob is oh, clearly Darren, having a an affair. Teenager watching this, would you stop with your youth? It's like this is a family-friendly film where the hero is having what amounts to an affair, um, yeah. and destroying his marriage as part yeah. of a midlife crisis. Yeah. Um, getting mm-hmm. in shape, doing exercise, running off for weekends where he pretends to be working. Just and it's like, you know, yeah. that's a lot of effort. That's <laughs> I don't know if anybody, I I wouldn't do that. All right, but yeah, that, and it still holds up. This very adult. Fear I really in it. like it. I, I, I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Well worth seeking out. All right, so let's move on to the week in film news. What do you got? Uh, well, in terms Hoo-ah. of international news, who ah, Duncan Chino's baby, Duncan Chino's. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so in terms of, of international news, a couple of big stories happening internationally that we probably have to cover. Um, at Cannes, we've been covering Cannes news uh, quite a bit, but it's came out that Roman Polanski trying to sell his latest movie at Cannes, and no biters, which yeah, is... Uh, and he was selling it to 14-year-olds. No, he wasn't. But yeah. uh, that does sound like something he would <laughs> Uh, yeah, he, yeah. he didn't show up, but Jean Dujardin was put in the... Well, again, he's, Jean, he's Jean not allowed in France, right? Yeah, Jean, Jean Dujardin, who would literally do anything for money as far to, as I can see. I was, say, <laughs> oh I was about to say Jean Dujardin was put in the awkward place having to defend it. And I'm like, no, he chose to be in a yeah, Polanski yeah, film. Yeah, no, no, he cho- and he yeah. very much shows he's been some extremely predatory French comedies and he's managed yeah. to hide that well from international viewers. Because none of them have got the international distribution. He's a bad person. All right. Judging by the kind of things that he... Oscar winner Jean Dujardin. The kind of things that he decides are worth putting his weight behind yeah. Yeah. bad dude yeah. um, and also uh, sorry um, what's it sorry Woody Allen um, who has released a trailer for his latest movie on his own Bless Facebook page him. yeah he's really he's got pushing. Facebook yeah he's well, he doesn't. His assistants yeah. have faith. Did he really say tired? Yeah, nothing he, about that. No, no, on his own. <laughs> like, no. Yeah, but somebody sure to pick it up. Usually, people will yeah. pick up anything. Really yeah, and it's, it's and of course, in keeping with the theme that we just discussed, it has a release date in France of 18 September. Oh, naturally. Does it look any use? Does, Have you seen it? No, I'm not watching it. All oh, right, just uh, sorry. I'm oh, not, I'm not specific. Yeah, sorry. So very, I apologize. I'm not watching it either. I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to whether because because the actors the... have kind of disowned it. I'm need to yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, they've Timothy disowned Chalamet's... Alan more than yeah. the film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could, it could well be a great film. We'll never know. Actors have denied to me too. Um, in terms you won an Oscar, are you interested? Yeah. <laughs> you won't. Well, no, I don't. Well, I mean, you say that, but Bo Rap got, uh, you know, managed to get much further than you would expect mm. it to, despite their publicity team's best efforts. Uh, nominate us for Best Actor. If they, best Actor. Best Actor. If they Not take his name off it, maybe it'll go for yeah. Um And in terms of other news, uh, the abortion ban in Alabama, because we're getting very political this week. Jeez, the studios we? reacting. Grace will be disgusted to miss this. Studios reacting to the abortion ban in Alabama eventually. Well, it's uh, Netflix, took long enough. It's Netflix have ruled out. I've said basically, yeah, they will not continue in there, and that seems to have sort of set. Out, and again, this is one of the things where you wonder how much of this is actual like company policy, and how much of this is just playing well and pandering to social media. But uh, in some ways, it doesn't really matter, does it? it? Like you in, hope in, it in, in the grand yeah, scheme of things, you hope that really it matter. has the effect yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, I don't really care what yeah. you do it. Yeah, as long yeah, as they do, as long as they do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Netflix have said that they can't see their relationship with uh, Alabama continuing, and um, same, and yeah, and. Uh, I then won't even Dis- listen to Sweet Home Alabama. After this then after. Disney uh, came out as well and said that they did they? also not be able. They're going to pull their five hundred films. Yeah, and they're releasing this and year. And Warner Media uh, have come out as well and said that they would have to seriously reconsider the nature of their relationship. Do they see serious? Like this is this is what I'm curious about. Like those statements sound very qualified. Yeah, that's exactly. That that's it's like we of, may. Yeah, this is like, like just say like just we're say not that, yeah. as opposed to like you know. No, that, that, that's kind of what I was getting at. When yeah, I was saying they, I that I'm, right. they're no, not think... like there's a bit of fe- fence sitting and sort of hedging and stuff like that. Bollocks. Warner Media will reconsider. Oh, sorry, it's it's uh, Georgia actually, uh, which is more interesting because Georgia has Atlanta, which has been huge for things like uh, the Spider-Man movies. Shoot yes. in Atlanta to pick an example. Uh, but yeah, so Warner Media would reconsider production in Georgia if the abortion law, law uh, holds. So they're saying if it holds, they might or yeah, might we, not. Uh, Disney said it would be quote unquote very difficult. Uh, for them to and what work, did Netflix right? say? Do we know? Uh, Netflix and Netflix says? says it will actually join the fight. Netflix says it will it'll good, commit good, to this, which is Netflix. actually to be fair to Netflix. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Probably Shane the other studios in Sweden. Probably. Well, I imagine anyway. that's what it was. Very yeah. telling that like Netflix did it first and everybody else ended up following. I well, mean, that that is telling in a lot of ways. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, I mean, we were talking during the week to move the conversation in a generally lighter direction, but in terms of like algorithmic sort of yeah, stuff, yeah. where you have studios now employing algorithms to read scripts, which is stuff that Netflix has been doing since. I got to change my name to algorithm. And I get I get paid like half business, a million yeah. a week to be. What are you going to do? We're going to run it by the algorithm. Let's make this counter argument script <laughs> three hundred million. Yeah. The algorithm said it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just hire a guy yeah. called Alan Green. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that checks out. This guy knows what he's talking about. Pronounce green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, let's let's move then closer to home in terms yes. of in terms of actual film coverage and film discussion. A um, couple of small notes first. Uh, Dublin Old School will be hitting Netflix in the UK and Ireland from June first, so just in time for the bank holiday. Sunday, I think. Yeah, Saturday, is it Saturday. Saturday? I, think I don't know. Whatever day. So. Oh, it's Saturday. Sorry, I apologize. Yes, yeah. no, it. I wasn't as gone on Dublin Old School as everybody else is. I did like it. I, didn't I really love liked it. it. I didn't um, love it as much as most, but I liked it a I, lot. But then how do I like it less than you if you didn't love it more than most? <laughs> How's that impossible, Aaron? What level are we A lot of people really love this. Yeah. Ronan? I haven't seen it. No, there, you know you have literally no excuse. Yeah. But I, I really liked it. I suspect I'll, I'll you will be... loathe I, I suspect... Yeah, I will loathe <laughs> this. Oh, no. It's harsh, Darren. Just going by like law of average. When have the three of us ever like had oh, a vaguely okay. positive yeah. consensus? I, I don't know. Let's find out. Tune in next. Wow. <laughs> Tune in about two years. <laughs> have yeah. We must have. Have we? Have we ever agreed on something? We have. We, we all we lost you. Like, never really here. Yes. There we go. Yes. That was the only one. Is that made all four. <laughs> that was I'm sure there's other things. We all like Memento. That's, yes. Yeah. There yeah. You go. To there use a go. recent yeah. example. So. You, <laughs> See, How re- could you I've recently that? mentioned the dog right? from, yeah. from 2000. <laughs> we Two are films like in 100 years. Here we go again. Well, well, yeah. But Darren yeah, doesn't like it enough. No, oh, oh, you don't oh, like oh. it enough, Darren. <laughs> you don't, you don't like, worship it at all. It made Darren. like my top 40. <laughs> Stop. All right. Um, the trailer what? for Metal Heart. Uh, who did you just say? Who are? Yeah. The <laughs> trailer for Metal Heart is now available online. Actually, if you want to yes, check it I'm out. Yes, I look forward to this. It's your Connor's film. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm Mr. Galway. Um, it's out in a couple of weeks. It's out on June 28th as well, which so I'm, four weeks. Yeah, which so we're really, really way looking off. forward to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to. It. Nothing uh, but good things about yes. this. And it's uh, Jordan Jones, who's fantastic. Uh, in terms mm-hmm. of moving away from Irish productions, but worth noting in Irish interest, the trailer for The Goldfinch is also. Uh, I didn't watch well. this. I didn't mean to watch it. Uh, I quite like the novel. The novel is one of these weird. Uh, Pulitzer, right? I the it's Donald Tartt's uh, kind of long way to follow up to the secret history and this, this something friend, little friend, I think. Uh, she, which she wrote back in the old days when I used to read books when Ronan was not born uh, or whatever. And she was one of those great kind of secretive authors that released two books that were t- tremendous. Oh, okay. by him. And then released the Goldfinch about, I don't know, five years ago, maybe yeah, six I've years ago. Um, I read the Goldfinch. It's a strange novel. It doesn't always work. And the last chunk of it is a bit, ugh, I don't know what the film is going to do with it. But uh, there's a lot of stuff in it really interesting. John Crowley, uh, who's... Uh, Who did Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, and, which again, which I imagine was a lot of part of getting the films, uh, Oh, no, he did Intermission as well. And um, uh, what's the one with Keira Knightley? That's not very good. And Mark Ruffalo. Did he do that? No, you're thinking of the you're thinking of Begin Again, which was... Um, that's not John Carney. Book. John Carney, yeah, which was Sing Street. Is that John Carney not doing this? Then? No. Oh, for fuck's sake. I, I thought you were the same person. <laughs> anyway. No, they're, they're two different people. Um, I know, but I thought John Carney was the guy to do this. No, this is Crowley. <sighs> I'm tired. Okay. There's too many names with John. Change your... Too many opinion. films, too many people. Yeah, All not right. enough time. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. I liked Intermission. I didn't... I loved Intermission. Uh, Intermission's yeah, really I know. good fun. It is. Yeah. Um, and I think that it came at a time when Irish cinema, again, in terms of mainstream access, because I remember yeah. being one of the first Irish films that everyone was like, you have to see this in yeah. cinemas. Yeah, um, true. Great okay. opening scene as well. Yeah. Uh, Brooklyn's Kerry great. I, I have a Brooklyn's lot of time for Brooklyn. Wonderful. Yeah. I have I a lo- my eyes. Except me too. The sister relationship. Oh my oh. God. Oh. Except for the rugby person. Though. Oh God. Why would you have any attraction? Never, Come never on. be attracted to the rugby yeah, person. Italian, as a, as a he makes Dolby oh. Yeah. Like, I mean, you Why is he your Don Mio it's, day? It's stereotype. Yeah, I like, I mean, you know. He's still, better than, he's still better than the rugby guy though. The thing about ethnic stereotypes is that in the case of Italians, the stereotype is they're hot. And the good food. Rugby boys are not. <laughs> and they're awful people. Um, but yeah, so um, the Galway Film Fair, in association with Bankside Film, have announced a €3,000 cash award for the best project at this yes. year's marketplace. Yes, excellent. Um, what, so what I mean, the Canada's market, which is right there. That's, that's right, it's literally there to be made. Um, but yeah, that's no. 0.1% of the budget. Yeah. 0.001%. I want <laughs> oh, 150 million. Talking, yeah, I mean, 150 million. It's going million, to actually build. 
Old Dublin. I'm going to literally rebuild Dublin and then destroy it. 150 million <laughs> minimum. <laughs> or I'm not compromising. Uh, but yeah, so Bankside Film, who are sort of bankrolling this. Uh, yeah, Bankside bankrolling. Uh, but they've uh, enjoyed a great deal of success with Irish films uh, in recent years. Uh, the Such Hole in the Ground, as... for oh, example, uh, which was acquired by A24 in the US. Yes. Uh, and TIFF titles, including uh, Poppy Chulo, which will be opening here soon. Ah, yes. really? Um, and Peter Strickland's In Fabric, which will be oh, that by poster, A24. excellent. Yeah. Jeez, that poster of the week is fabulous for that film. Yeah. What if Doctor Strange's cape tried to murder people, basically, is what it amounts but to. But plus, bonus point, no Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> <laughs> so we can all we can all agree on that, I think. And we can all very much look forward to this uh, this flat, because I think, are we all going? I am not. I think I have to Damn. drop out. I, uh, I will be going, but we need to organise soon. Immediately. Immediately. All right, then. Let's move on to talking about the top 10. Yes. At number 10, it's still a good boy. A dog's journey. <laughs> How is that possible? It's been here for 84 years. 200,000 euro at the Irish box office. Well, actually, 10% of Christ. it's Ronan's money. Actually, 199,315 euro. Let's be clear. It's not quite So enough. all it needs to do is... <laughs> couple but, more tickets and yeah, there. that's it. And you could do it this weekend. But yeah, so this it's, is kind of it's quite something. I'm sure families are enjoying it. Yeah. It's not very good, but you know, it is what it's very weird. I'll give it that. It's yeah, extraordinarily it's weird. A very strange family friendly film. Yeah. Speaking of, at number nine, it's Big B Dumbo. Really? Yep, still in there. Fucking hell. This is Darren's money. Two point uh, three million euro at the Irish box office today. So we're one of three thing, major Disney films yeah. in the top ten at the moment. We're going to continue to get these awful live action animated. Well, it's never oh, going to yes. stop anyway. Oh, but I, well, I mean, a few Pete's Dragons probably would have done it. But uh, yeah, but that Pete's Dragon wasn't a, you know, yeah. A Disney name as such. But yeah, at number eight, it's Paw Patrol Mighty Pups, which uh, Niall what talked about last week. Oh, I guess yeah, the dogs thing. Stop yeah. with the dogs thing. Yeah, already. which is actually two episodes edited together and two episodes of an unrelated show edited into it. That. Sounds like Niall talked about last week. It sounds like the weirdest indoctrination for child murderers ever. Terry Brady has an excellent review of it. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Very existential. Yeah. Yes, it is very Extremely. good. I yeah. really like it. It will give you pause before considering. Uh, at That's number seven, The Hustle, which is doing remarkably well in at the Irish box office. Pretty much everyone hates it. Yeah, That's considering awesome. everyone hates it, and but again, it's it's a comedy at the Irish box office, which much. means it's earned three hundred and sixty-five thousand euro today. On the basis of literally one star reviews from yeah. practically everyone. Yeah, what is That's this? remarkable. And Hathaway remake and Rebel Wilson remaking Dirty Rotten, Rotten Scoundrels. Scoundrels. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. At number six, it's Avengers Endgame, How which is. Already close to, to replacing Avatar as the number one highest grossing movie of all time. Well, in, stalking, in, yeah, in stalking distance. How much is it in um, Ireland? Uh, in Ireland, it's earned 6.1 million euro. That's which a will top play five, in the I think, top is it? 10. And, yeah, becoming into the, somewhere five, around the I expect five or five, six, six anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is quite impressive. So it still hasn't made as much money as Mamma Mia. Just to get get everything important out of the way. I, no. and, and deservedly so. Cause I, I wasn't Here we a, go again. I wasn't money, a big fan money, of Endgame. Money, money. Last, but, uh, you know. But it's me. earned all the money. So it's, you know, I mean, I feel like you can't really feel too sorry for Endgame. No. I'm not feeling sorry for it. I'm saying that it wasn't very good. <laughs> At number five, uh, John Wick Chapter 3 Parabellum. Uh, Another dog movie. These have some bad boys in how much, them. How much, is, how much is this? Um, this weekend it made 101,000 but in total it's made 477,000. Was it a big preview thing or was it last weekend? And last weekend it. was quite good as well. It didn't top the poll last weekend. It didn't yeah. dethrone Detective Pikachu interestingly enough. Um, but hey. I'm not that fussed about John Wick. I liked the first one. I didn't really like the second one. It got a bit tiring. Uh, I can't imagine. I imagine it's diminishing returns. I'll probably catch it. it. No. But I'm not going to watch it has, it in the cinema. It's... He kills two dudes with a horse. No, but it's not a darn... They're not very good though. That's that's this is I I can get I get the cultural appeal and they're massively considering the amount of money they kind of don't really make. They've a massive cultural imprint because and it's Keanu's kind of doing yeah, it. Well, who and that's why no, that I know man. I love Keanu. He's great. I know I'm not this. <laughs> I, I love. There's a Keanu yeah. Ramos. He's coming to the lighthouse. It's yeah. like I mean this is and I have no issue with Point Break. All the rest of it, Speed. All they're all fantastic, right? And the Matrix and all the rest of it. But it really gets your wit. But these aren't very good though. It's like. 
people have just kind of just had amnesia towards good films because they love Cano so much. They're just not good. Counterpoint. They're like they're good. They're like that. That's my counterpoint. That's my counter counter argument. What about stuntmen? But with Keanu Reeves. Yeah. Whoa, three films. The stunts going to be great. Are the films going to be good? It doesn't matter. It's Keanu Reeves running around and, and, what and I mean? fighters pretending to be slow so 50-year-old men can beat them. No. no, no. Fighters, I don't like fighters nah, pretend to be on. slow. There's, I don't a, there's a little bit of that. Nah. 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 Just because it doesn't crank the camera. It's not crank. Because nothing is crank. Cranks a crank's a masterpiece. Crank As is Crank 2. Crank, like crank 2 might though. be the best sequel of all you time. Can, can well, I can't because I haven't seen John Wick. Okay. I, I, I actually right. no, as a kind of deciding vote I'm fascinated to see when you yeah. think of it I like they use the word fascinating I'll try at to number... watch it I, I tried to do it again Darren yeah. just to kind of roll in see what it. I can do at number four Pokemon Detective Pikachu I will not watch no, this no me neither not even as a deciding vote do you, want, do you want to guess how much this is made at the Irish 64 Club today? billion dollars <laughs> like how much do we think an animated oh, okay, yeah. Pokemon movie Pokemon in the style 1.5 is... million what one no, no less actually. It's only um, your nine hundred and twelve thousand yeah, euro. Shit. But what's incredible is that Pokemon Sorry. was incredibly popular when I was a kid, and still is. I have a Pokemon a nef- Go. A nephew. It made a big yeah, Pokemon, Pokemon Go. Back then about two, three years. But ago. it never really went away. Even before Pokemon Go came along, no, my I, nephew I, was I, telling me all about Pokemon. I barely Pokemon heard of it before then. Silver like, and gold mm. and all those sort of like. Those they go way back. Like no, yeah. we're we're onto things that aren't even colors now. Oh, it's, okay. Yeah, they've gone to pastel shades that are. I don't know. What's going on with the world? I, I mean, have you heard about Pokemon Sleep is the new one? No, of course I haven't. Darren. Pokemon Sleep? Look at me. So, right. <laughs> of course I haven't. I thought you might be hip with the kids. I am barely alive, Darren. Just okay. tell me what it but is. But Pokemon Sleep, so Pokemon Go was very successful in encouraging kids to go out and walk and explore. Oh, yeah. And yeah, fall yeah, off yeah, cliffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. The dumb kids, maybe. I apologise. Sorry. Jesus, the dumb kids. Darren. I'm sure a lot of very bright kids were distracted by their phones. Darren, well, anyway, Mooney, wash your mouth out. I apologise. Darren, so, let's push kids off cliffs, Mooney. <laughs> well, there go my chances of running as a, as a local candidate in the next election. They'll but probably no, get you elected. More, yeah, um, if I go in the Midwest. Uh, but yeah. Oh, oh. Darren is throwing shade at everyone at the moment. But anyway, my point is, so Pokemon Sorry, go, on, Go, which encouraged kids yep. to go out walking and exploring and adventuring yes. And to see the world and sort of like my niece does it with her dad yeah. and everything and it's it's, it's yeah it's, it's very and it's very it's very wholesome very it's, good it's, it's very wholesome and I it's agree. actually been suggested that it's, it's helping curb things like childhood obesity and stuff like that okay. yeah. so Pokemon have decided they're going to lean into this they've now got Pokemon Sleep which is a game that trains and catches Pokemon while you sleep so, so if you're, to go to bed. That's it. So if you're having difficulty getting your kids to go to bed, you say, let's play Pokemon Sleep. And it monitors their sleep to make sure they're asleep, which is kind of creepy. If it yes. was any other company yes. apart from Nintendo and Pokemon, probably still a little bit creepy. Still but creepy. anyway, but uh, yeah, monitors make sure they're asleep and then sort of like trains their Pokemon based on how much sleep they get. And that's then they'll murder you in your sleep. Kind of wholesome. It is, isn't it? Tell me that's it not a adorable. Data, harvesting kind oh, of yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. But we're not allowed to have nice things. At number Indeed. three, Rocket Man, which has done reasonably well. It earned something like five million at the uh, British box office, which is about half bow rap money. But I think if it takes home half bow rap money I, in general, it will oh, be I'm very happy. Stupidly well considered. I'm probably not going to see garbage. this. But what I will say. Are you going to see it? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, what I will say though. <laughs> Sorry, is, you got uh, me very excited. Sorry, Dan. It was a little bit funny. This feeling inside. No, I, I don't even understand. It's the a references. sacrifice issue, isn't it? It's a music. sacrifice. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Dexter Fletcher. Um, I'll give him his due in terms of coming in, in terms of the bow rap kind of yeah. rescue thing. Even Didn't though, help. even though Brian Singer fucking earned the money, the piece of shit. Mm-hmm. But Flex Fletcher is on Wild Bill, which I really liked. Um, I think he's a decent director. The Vogue and uh, Paul Dwan's such in this would be nice uh, kind of Twitter stuff during the week of the Vogue of. Uh, kind of biopics post walk art is bizarre like walk art doesn't exist yeah. in any real shape well, I mean it doesn't it made no it's money bonk. it doesn't matter yeah. but it's, it was, it's, it's a cultural shadow oh, well, there, like I mean it does it exists yeah there, there was there was a wonderful oral history of it on the ringer this week which, which I'm going to read, actually, I, read yeah, I can't wait to read it's it very worth seeing, I'd yeah. say my favourite for, for later and I mean it's it's really heartbreaking when you have people talking about how sad they were when that they heard it, that it should like, have gone over like gangbusters like John C. Riley. I was at Joe Apatow saying that he was on holidays with his with his family and his daughter, who was a kid at the time, has said that look you got when you answered the phone to hear the box office returns for the movie haunted me for the rest of my childhood. 
Um, John C. Oh, Riley saying, "Don't tell too much. I want to. I want to read okay, it. So okay, don't sorry. give all the holdings. Oh, okay. I'm reading for three. But yeah, um, but, but yeah. So like, I can understand why. Amazing. Yeah, I can understand why people are immune to walk. Why you do not want any part of this. And he never, not no. once, paid for drugs. <laughs> but yeah, um, I can understand why it has no impact. It's kind of great though that it remains relevant. Like yes. I watched it after watching Bohemian Rhapsody, and it is Bohemian beat Rhapsody. Beat. And it's B for B. All the things like." Sorry, Dewey Cox likes to remember his entire life story before he plays a concert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great. It, um, it's genuinely Ringo Starr of the Beatles great. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, then. And at number two, we have The Secret Lives of Pets 2. Uh, yeah, so I, many pets and I've never films. seen the first one. I don't really want to see this. Is there any good? Nah. Uh, Tell me that. Nah, that's good enough. That that sound is good enough for me, Darren. I'm not going to see it. And at number one, it's a whole new world, but not really for Aladdin, having me. earned nearly Would half a million euro stop. at the Irish box office in its opening weekend, having done phenomenally well internationally, having exceeded box office expectations. Uh, which means that you're going to be seeing more and more and more of these, even after I the don't Lion care. King. I won't be seeing them. <laughs> I didn't like this very much. Did you I, see that? No, I haven't seen it. <laughs> Very good, Rob. Very good. I'm sure I wouldn't have if I hadn't seen it. <laughs> I'm not going to see it. Uh, the yeah, trailer was more confident. than sufficient. It's perfectly confident. It's a perfectly confident piece of work. Perfectly no, it's confident. not. It's, Is it grand? It's kind of grand, yeah. All right. oh, it's, only kind of grand. it's only kind of it's grand. It's also a two star. Well, it's, it's a two star. It's a three, it's a three star. It's, it's not. It, You're a gentleman's tree, isn't it, it though? It does what it says. Oh, up. we're going to be hitting the two. We're going to be hitting the two stars in a moment when we get to the new releases. So uh, don't Yeesh. you worry about that. A All right. Too? Uh, yeah, very gentle. The most gentlemanly oh, of twos, oh, perhaps. Oh. All right, so let's talk about the upcoming releases. Hit me. Um, this weekend, uh, Netflix have a new release, which is Always Be My Maybe. Uh, which is uh, the romantic comedy starring Ali Wong and Randall Park. I'll probably watch this. Um, uh, I like Netflix romantic comedies because they're easy, nice. Th- this is like a good turn, yeah, turn is off. It, no, no. It's again. This is the thing where the romantic comedy has had a bit of a revival lately, thanks to stuff like uh, The Big Sick, Crazy Rich Asians. Set it up. Uh, set it up even on Netflix uh, as well. And what's interesting all about I love before. Always be my maybe is that it demonstrates that like not only were those competent romantic comedies, those were good romantic comedies. In that, like always be my maybe is a competent out of the box factory settings romantic comedy. It's just an al- the algorithm. That's it exactly. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. well, to be fair and to give credit where it's due. It was actually written uh, by Wong and by Park. But it's very strange because it feels like it was almost designed by algorithm. There's I mean, like, for example, a whole host of 90s... Probably was if it's Netflix. Yeah, there's a whole host of 90s nostalgia in there. The title itself being an allusion to uh, the 1995 Mariah Carey single, Always Be My Baby. I did but, not get that. But I for example... Yeah, like Randall Park, who is 45 years old and born in 1974, is playing a character... Yes, he's older than me! In your face, world! Not in Sorry. this Not in this film, he's not. He's playing a character oh, who is God a teenager during the 90s. So the film can include what? references to things like Wayne's World, to pick an example. Um, oh, that God, it can, I'm so old. I'm yeah, so ancient. That it can, oh, like, one of the big emotional beats of the film is set during like 1999, that millennial anxiety, in which, Randall, the man's in which anxiety. Randall Park, a 45-year-old man, puts on a wig and some baggy clothes to play his 18 year old self I don't mind um, that to some degree if what I mean, <laughs> well, I mean is like, if you're not aware. yeah like, exactly it, you can kind of do that in a very kind of knowing way yeah. that I'm okay if you're pretending to be seriously younger and it doesn't work then you're an idiot as yeah. a filmmaker or whatever like, do you know what I mean like yeah. I don't mind. I'm, I'm, I'm I'll allow it to a certain yeah. point. And this is like again, this is something where it, again it feels very algorithmically designed. It features I don't know. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's no, in the trailer. No, it's in the trailer. The trailer. It features a cameo from a pretty big uh, star. Probably it's a big Carey, share. Roy Carey. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's neither of them. Oh, um, like, Lady Gaga. Think about as big as you could be at the moment. The the the, the closing song of Stella John Voight. Okay, I'm not going to name them. <laughs> <John> <laughs> That would be amazing. <laughs> like, particularly given how the film uses this car- uses this celebrity, because this celebrity- President Duarte of the Philippines. Because this cele- this the film uses a celebrity in like the romantic rival role. Um, so I'm kind of imagining John where John I'm Voight, going back to John, John Voight. Voight, like as the romantic <laughs> I'm rival for I'm Ali going Wong. Back to, I'm sticking um, with John Voight. I've please, never been more please, certain please, of anything in my again, life. But again, that's something. The use of that celebrity is great. The celebrity's okay. game. It's very charming. The celebrity's and, gay. Like, game. Oh right. Sorry. And it's it's very charming. It's very engaging. Um, <laughs> Because he's game. Yes. Is what I meant. So game. It's game. so game. He's so game. game. Is that all you meant? He's game as Christmas. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, potential to everyone on this podcast. Okay. I'm sorry, I've had too much Guinness. Anyway, <laughs> go on. But yeah, so you know, 
And again, there's a sense that while the while that star is game, Jay, yes, game, game, uh, while that star is game, um, <laughs> the idea is that the film is it feels almost again something like the internet loved, almost designed by algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Randall's have a bit of that, even with yeah. the good stuff. They, they like I mean, there's that. no yeah. scene of characters watching other movies you might like on Netflix, which is a standard trope. <laughs> I kind of like that, even no. if it's creepy and terrible. No. But there's also like Randall Park's, Randall Park's character Netflix. I feel like I can relate to them. I am also watching a movie on Netflix, uh, but Randall Park's character is a member of the ba- of a band who sings sort of mimetic songs that you can tell the film wants to go viral. Or what songs? No. M- sort of no, mimetic no, songs. No. Like, so the, the closing What's that theme, word again, sorry? Mimetic. I thought, oh, miming kind of M- no. Like meme. Oh, oh, Jesus. There's a word, is it? Oh, God, yeah. it's bold. Yeah. Mimi. Yeah. But anyway. So, on the floor. But the idea is that, yeah, he sings songs that the film, you know, can tell is hoping the internet will love no. because they're self referential and self aware. No, no, and, no, like, no. all of this is distracting from a the lot, fact that. In fairness it's... to it, though, a lot of films have done exactly that. Yeah. It's just Netflix have. Yeah, uh, weaponized. <laughs> and that's, I, I, that's the difference. True. Like. And and like I mean, it's not bad. Like it's abs- It's not bad. It's just doesn't have any of the things that distinguish. Like again, the stuff that made like recent revivals of the form. Like, yeah. like set it up had that tremendous chemistry between its two leads. And it's fine. Set it up is great. Yeah. Oh, it's so yeah. good. I'm gonna rewatch it. And it just it sparked. So it was able to do that sort of screwball yes. forty style comedy thing that so few movies and are. Really difficult and to like, do. It. And again, Wong and Park are are great. Park is a slightly stronger actor than Wong because he has more experience. But the two of them are great. That, but they don't click in the same way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that sort of thing. It well, doesn't probably still watch it. It doesn't have the same understanding of its core tropes in the same way that yeah. like Crazy Rich Asians does, which allows Crazy yeah, Rich yeah, Asians yeah. to do things like that. Yeah. It doesn't have the heart of the big sick to pick an example, and it doesn't necessarily capitalize on this idea of like you know sort of diversifying yeah, yeah. Uh, its cast in the way that something like Late Night does to pick yeah. an example that's coming out soon enough. Um, so all of that adds up to a film that is you know. Maybe okay. Well, I'll be watching it for yeah. the jump by cameo anyway. Yeah, and I feel like I've sort of let you down now. I feel like you'll be almost disappointed afterwards. I, oh, I better not be either. I have to be held to pay. Um, in terms of other releases that are out this week, uh, there is oh Godzilla King of the Monsters. Oh wow! Speaking of shit shows, this has got <laughs> terrible reviews across yeah. the board. Yeah, it's not good. Um, it is, and again, like I don't want to be too harsh on it. But it's like that proverbial ten pounds of shit in a five pound bag, <laughs> except they're also throwing it at a fan and it's going everywhere. And you're watching it. You don't happen. want to be too hard you're, on it, and that's what you say. You're watching it right in front of you, and you're like, "Man, that fan kept going for two hours and ten minutes. That's a pretty well designed fan." But you're also just covered in shit. Um, but yeah, <laughs> the thing with it's like that Veeam joke. It's like a book whose covers are just made of shit and you think, what could be in here that they've covered it in shit? And you open it and it's just shit. Yeah. More shit. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, the thing, there are lots of problems with this. Yeah. Um, the most obvious is the fact that it it looks like it was designed to take the worst possible or, okay, the most incompatible aspects of the two films leading into it. It was very clearly designed as a sequel to Godzilla from 2014. So it borrows that weird preoccupation that a lot of American adaptations of foreign films have on the American nuclear, get it, family, uh, where it's about this family unit dealing with the loss of a child that's pushed two parents apart and they have to reconcile over the course of the film or try to come to terms with one another while their daughter's sort of stuck in the middle between them. And the film thinks this is fascinating even though like, you know, it's been done to death. And also you're not watching a Godzilla movie for that stuff. Like why, why would you do that? But the film is very, very insistent on that point and it's very invested in that idea of drama. Uh, while at the same time, it looks like while they're in production, Kong Skull Island was released. And was it hit? It was a hit and like critics generally loved it and you can tell that they were too late to actually change the structure of the film but instead decided they'd take all the glib funny self-aware stuff in and like try and make it more playful while still maintaining the basic structure of a very dour very serious family drama with monsters in it like the the prop like surely even before you get to the uh, the the latest one what was the one before the, not the so Godzilla 2014 no the one after what was it uh, Kong Skull Island Kong Skull they're related like, yeah well they're not we're really. setting up Godzilla vs. Kong but the point that's for 2020 the point that I'm making is that before <laughs> you Ronan, Ronan's very invested in this before we get to Kong Skull Island what I'm saying is the first Godzilla the fourth 2014 one is terrible so Maybe they should have been thinking Lebinage. differently. Yeah, uh, and Brian Cranston. Yeah. Um, and yet somehow decides Aaron Taylor Johnson is your viewpoint. It's Garrett. not a good no. film. My point is, it, Darren, it's not a good film. Don't even, Darren. I okay. watched seven minutes of it and fell asleep. Ronan, you had the best deal of all of us here. Yep. Well, that means um, you got Brian Benosh. It's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but my point is, you may have waited till Skull Island 
had a run before you might have started making this is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Considering but, how bad 2014's Godzilla was. Well, to be was, fair, the, the critical might... reception to it was vaguely positive. 70% positive on Rotten Tomatoes to Godzilla. No, it and what, wasn't. Yes, it everybody was. hated this. 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. As much as these things are Fucking not a metric idiots. or anything important. No, I'm sorry, no. I remember every it's conversation IMG. I had was terrible. Uh, Everybody. I, okay. Godzilla fans you were existed, screaming about you how existed terrible. a bubble though we existed I a... don't ex- <laughs> I don't even like Godzilla so much like I'm not existing in a bubble alright alright all right, all right. but anyway my uh, point Darren, is if I have a fucking seizure because this I'm going to kill you <laughs> no my point is <laughs> right, right, sorry, my point is right, regardless on. of what you think of the previous two films right I didn't mind Skull Island so much. This movie combines the... Like, worst the, aspects of both. Not the worst aspects, but the parts that least mesh together. Yeah, so you have stuff like witty one-liners from characters as Washington, D.C. burns floods with tens of thousands of people dying underneath. You have this... It's a very no. horny movie. What? A surprisingly horny movie. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of... Uh, yeah. Well, if he's heading to go fight Roden, he's looking for food, a fight, or something more intimate. Thank you, Kyle Chandler. Wasn't there a Jeff Wells kind of thing about Godzilla's ass yep. review, which is... Uh, what? Yeah. yeah. Godzilla's a little bit chunky in this one. Um, but you can't say it because, you know, you have breakfast. fat shame. So yeah, because you, you uh, that that's Jeff Wells' takeaway. So yeah, but the thing is that it just... And it, it keeps cramming stuff in there when it just doesn't but that's the horny bit, is it? And register. <laughs> <laughs> ten pounds, like, five pounds. There are ten... Oh. Ten minutes I'm in, in the middle... Of this film, where the film goes from, oh, by the way, the evil monster, which is a three-headed dragon, is also an alien. And you're like, what, what, what? We're going we're gonna to talk about that, right? And it's like, oh, by the way, Godzilla's hiding out in Atlantis, just taking a breather. And like, wait, wait, what? In Atlantis? Um, and it's like, oh, by the way, we have to nuke Atlantis. You're like, what? And it just it keeps going. It's exhausting. I walked out of the cinema feeling like I had a concussion. And not a fun. I kind. feel like I have a concussion. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so that's that's about where we are this so week. That's terrible. Uh, <laughs> they didn't release anything alongside that. Ma, such a uh, Ma is also at this. Ma, quite what's a film about Northside Dublin? Ma, Tate Taylor, Tate like. Taylor, the director. Who's of, Tate Taylor? He directed was it the Help or the Blind Side? One of those. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm out. Uh, uh, star, <laughs> starring, um, either one, I'm out. starring Olivia uh, uh, Spencer. Octavia okay. Spencer, sorry. Yeah, I like um, Octavia Spencer. And it's a it's a Bloomhouse horror movie. Um, uh, and apparently, like, we're, we're on this has me interested. Is this the prequel to Mama? Uh, no. <laughs> that's actually pretty good. That's there, a good yeah. joke, yeah, though. Come on. Yeah. And then M, the Fritz Lang film, yeah. is the first one. But it's, hey. it's about a middle-aged woman who befriends a bunch of teenagers. Um, and then things take a sort of a misery-style turn when they refuse to take her calls and start ignoring her. Oh, um, so like Greta, I could see her doing I'm this. Kind, yeah, I'm kind of like... I'm. Yeah, I was I, vaguely I, interested until I heard who was directing it, and then the reviews yeah. were like, "I'm kind of on board." She, I, um, I like Octavia Spencer. I, and I, she doesn't quite get enough to do in a lot of films. I see her in, yeah. Yeah. so it'd be nice to see her kind of rage about the stupid roles she's had over the past and kill teenagers. So you know, that'd be fun. Uh, Sunset is also out this week this, from the Laszlo Nemes. Laszlo Nemes of yeah. uh, the film that I didn't particularly like that everybody adored back in the day. Uh, Son of Saul. Son of Saul. Yeah. Uh, he I did was not adore with this. He was record. over. Well, thank you, Roland. He was over in the I'm lighthouse and the IFI. But he didn't get the lighthouse. He didn't get the lighthouse. He made. He got to the IFI. Yeah, I Philip saw this in London, I think, last year, and wasn't that gone it from my, my recollection. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't a fan of Son of Saul. Saul. I found it kind of empty in the way that was approached. I was fascinated by the technical aspects of it, which was yeah. really good. And I suspect the technical aspects will probably be on show from what I've seen of this one. Uh, but I'm not convinced them as a filmmaker as such. But I, the word on this one is kind of mixed, but, yeah. you know, okay, solid kind of fair, I think. People seem to be sort of impressed, but also bedazzled by it and not yeah. really... Yeah. You know, people are kind of impressed, not but warm. not loving it. Not yeah, yeah. Not and I think he's, a, he's, he's appreciative, tec- but as a technical director, impressive. I think most people would acknowledge. Yeah. yeah, but beyond that, yeah, I don't know if he's had to say. He did learn the ropes from Bellator, but that did not work last time. No, well, this did. Like, I mean, it's not tar his films with that brush. No, the in that way, Darren or Ronan, you could say that uh, you know David Russell learned from Scorsese. <laughs> No, uh, he was literally like Tara's assistant. No, I know, I know. Did, but uh, obviously he didn't absorb the right message. Yeah. All right. Um, and then also at this week, Thunder Road, uh, Jim Cummings film, which I talked about a bit about last week. You which did. I quite liked. It is very Sundance Indie in places, the point where it opens uh, with the quirky song and dance number. Run away! Um, no, it, it, like, no, but it, lost it, me. <laughs> it works to a certain... Like, it's not amazing. It hits a lot of the same I quite like Jim Cummings, so I can... 
and kind of a little more it works in large like. part due to Cummings as well as a writer Ooh, as a director yes. and as his own star mm. uh, he directed the short and basically financed this through Kickstarter he was okay. in these actors as well isn't he? yeah he's, he's an actor he's been in a couple of things I've, he's in something I've, I'll come back to you but uh, he's like I really there's something very. it's one of those things where again like a Sundance film it's a comedy that's not really a comedy mm. but it's got this literally really every pro- Sundance film really profound sense of melancholy and sadness <laughs> running though. through which again I, I we joke that I'm an emotional rock and I kind of am but this really got me there's something very sad very vulnerable very moving in this sort of portrayal of a man who's dealing with the loss of his mother and the disintegration of his marriage and trying to keep it all together yeah um Cummings is fantastic and mesmerizing and it's there's an incredible vulnerability there and a sense of well-intentioned stupidity which kind of prevents you from hating the character as much as some of his actions may almost kind of require um mm-hmm. it's a very delicate tightrope uh, for Cummings to walk and he does it exceptionally well I really like this uh with the caveat that yes it is very 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 American indie yeah. um and that's the worry I always have for these kind of things is that uh I I don't know for a lot of the time I don't know what differentiates them a lot you know what I mean yeah. that there's a certain and Ronan has probably seen it as much and many of them as I have as you have Aaron where you get that kind of American insensibility which to some degree is boilerplate and yeah. no, yeah, it, no, 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 no it's a little no, unfair no, 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 no. some but films can transcend that some films have to transcend even doing that formula well is, is like, like any formula doing the formula well works. yeah but it, there's certain things that you can do the formula well, but you can avoid certain obvious pitfalls. And a lot of them don't, is my issue. The wacky uh, the wacky outfits on the poster kind of thing is what I'm getting at. Or the song bit, or the, the, the karaoke bit, or whatever the bit is. But the acoustic guitar while people look mournfully in the distance. Yeah, all those things. And out this week, actually, yeah, from Monday, um, which is nice. Monday. Booksmart. What is happening? Released on Monday. It was done on last uh, Monday. No, no, it's this Monday. It was released this Monday in the UK and Ireland. It was released on Friday in the US. Uh, it earned <laughs> eight million at the US box office, it's which would seem quite reasonable, it's, but was. But, a but it's a low budget film, though. It's it? a low budget film. Um, it's got great word of mouth. Everybody yes. seems to adore it. I'm really. I fun. love this. This is one of my ten films of the year so far. Really? Now, again, we're admittedly only in May, and it's very early for making those lists. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely adore this. It has charm to burn. It's got incredible charisma. It's got two great central performances uh, from Beanie Fieldstein um, and Caitlin Deaver. Caitlin yeah. Deaver's a revelation. She was in Short Term 12. She was in Justified as well. Yes, I this know. This with in any look whatsoever will be a breakout role. I'm really looking forward um, to seeing this. Uh, I like Olivia Wilde. I've always liked her in stuff I first encounter in house yeah, all those years 13. ago yeah she's great uh, yeah. she's really really and nice. she's uh, she's an alumni of the Gaty School of Acting as well I believe um, oh, so is a bit she? of a local connection there as well but yeah, oh she is yeah she used to live she used to summer in uh, Waterford or Wexford or somewhere yeah. she's her dad's summered a news, yeah she's summered her dad <laughs> but, is a there is Irish parents our dad's Irish think he's a news correspondent or something oh. uh, so she'd be over here every summer but yes, yeah, so, well, we hooked um, up way. Back. No, we didn't. I'm joking. Wild uh, is uh, Wild is, is actually really good. It's yeah, one of great. the best directorial debuts I've seen from an actor in quite some time. It's quietly confident and sort of incredibly it's competent as well. There's no real showiness. There's no sense of well. Look, I was like that. In a, yeah, there's, uh, there's no real sense uh, of like I've been yeah. hanging. Look who I've been hanging out with yeah. and stolen their style from. So it's like there's no Boundbrick esque There's no like. I don't. I feel. I, I feel there's a there's, no, there's a, a kind of underlying D got something there, Darren. Well, I mean, there's no like again. There's no Bradley Cooper in A Star Is Born. Oh, okay. There's no Greta Gerwig doing her yeah. sort of Boundbrick esque stuff. Yeah, that's there's what no, I mean. That's, okay, okay. That's, that's, that's what I'm getting. At. All right. Do we, go, do we want to go down this road, Darren? Do we want to go down this road? No, we don't. Okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I know. Booksmart is, is really, really good. It's, it's charming. Really it's entertaining. It. And it's got an incredible well of empathy in it, which really sort of endears it and elevates it above a lot of the comparable sort of like student fare. Um, it's this kind of story of being a teenager and that great teenage coming of age arc where your arc is realizing that other people are people, basically. That other people are more complex than stereotypes you describe to them. And it works really well. It's consistently funny, uh, which is great. But it's also, yeah, it's it's very well observed and, and just has charm to burn. And it it has no malice in it, which really helps when you're doing a film like this. It's very easy for a film like this to seem aggressive or, or kind of like snooty or to look or down Roy the or kind Yeah, of, yeah. or arch. And, yeah. and like, I mean, particularly when you're dealing with teenagers as well. Um, it works very well when the earnestness plays very well in contrast to say the gross out humor and sort of the highly stylized bits yeah, and yeah. again the rhythm and structure of the no, I'm film. very much a um, yeah no I would wholeheartedly recommend it film of the week by a considerable margin yeah um, I would argue so if people are looking for a bit more Ronan a bit more Jay in their lives where can they find you 
Tune in next week. At Jay Coyle on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at Darren underscore Winnie, host another podcast called The 250, where this week we have Stacey Groudon on discussing glitter. Oh, wow. And Mariah Carey's one. So we're actually quite Go, Stacey. Glitter. Yeah, I know. Um, great. It's really, really good. So a discussion of Mariah Carey's entire career and contextualizing glitter uh, in American pop culture. No better woman. Nope. Nice. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, very, very happy how that turned out. We'll be back next week. Bye. Bye. Yeah.